what is good everybody man let me know if y'all can hear me in the chat <clears throat> man apologies for this this show coming a day late listen that's my second trip to north carolina this season man i had a blast up in elon but man that drive is that that, that drive is atrocious i just want to say driving to north carolina and back was was horrible man i do want to give prayers i don't know the family's name but there was a big crash on i-65 that i mean if we were um everyone was in park for about two hours on i-65 and i think um a, a man in his 40 or 50s passed away man so i do want to offer my condolences to his family man and i i we get impatient in traffic man but i, I definitely wanted to uh say that first because uh is I, I hate to see that man, but it made the drive a lot longer, man. Plus the rain, it was storming down the south this weekend, so um, had to get on here on Monday. But we have a packed show, as y'all know. The the SWAT coaches call was today, man. I, I was there in the beginning, but as y'all can imagine, the Auburn news when when that broke, I had to jump over to Auburn Live, so I didn't get to catch the end of the press conference. I did post um, some of the clips from the press conference today. Um, I got a live show after this live show for Auburn Live talking about the Harson uh, situation. But listen, <clears throat> I, I'll just start off the show because I know Mr. Campbell has already put it in the chat and everything. What's up, Zoe, man? What's good, man? Prom is not going to Auburn right now. It, <laughs> despite anything you may hear. Listen, the AD was hired probably the, – the AD was like kind of officially hired about 30, 45 minutes Um before the firing of of Harson happened today, so listen, any short list that you see, any hot board, it's all just speculation at this point. But the, what the president has told everyone is that he's going to try to put as much control into the new AD as possible. The new AD is from Mississippi State, and I think we'll we'll get some more information. Probably, I, I would say, no real hard information about who's getting an interview. Um, or anything like that, or who actually has interest moving forward is going to really be known up until I would probably say Wednesday and Thursday at the earliest, guys. But listen, I'll, I'll keep y'all updated on anything that I um I hear. But uh, right now, man, uh, Lane Kiffin, Hugh Freeze are probably the top two candidates. Lane Kiffin is most likely going to get the first offer, whatever that may be. He's going to command a uh he he's going to command a hefty price tag. But uh, based on everything I've heard, Auburn is going to probably offer whatever he wants. And Hugh Freeze, I know he has a new buyout, but what I was told is even with the increased buyout, I mean, with the increased contract, his buyout did not increase. So Auburn's willing to pay that buyout from Liberty. So what Hugh Freeze pretty much did, his agent finessed Liberty. What? What they negotiated is he used the Auburn interest as leverage to get a new contract with more money but also his agent somehow negotiated the buyout clause not be raised, which allows him to pretty much take the Auburn job if it's offered. But if he doesn't get hired, he used it for a raise. So listen, shout out to Hugh Freeze and his agent absolutely finessing that deal from Liberty. So I still think those are probably the two names. Some other names you you potentially could hear is Matt Rule. I think Charles Kelly over at Alabama is another name to potentially watch. But outside of that, man, everything else is just – uh. It's just pure speculation at this point. Carnell Williams announced the interim head coach, but let's get to the point of this show, man. Week 9 FCS recap. Call the number 701-779-9585. Um, we're going to do some game recaps. We got players of the week. We got the bracketology coming this week. My top 25s at the end, and also I did a top 10 um, – a top 10 HBCU rankings going into week 10. So I'll rank the top 10 HBCU programs as of right now. And I think that's going to uh, probably turn some heads. But, man, let's let's kick the show off real quick. Offensive players of the week, Bashul Tootin, North Carolina a t running back, hands down, player of the week. 256 rushing yards, two touchdowns, eight and a half yards per carry for North Carolina a t against Campbell. They made a furious comeback. And right now, a win next week puts a t probably in the playoffs. And it's it's a huge turnaround for Sam um, for Sam Washington. And uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm just impressed, man. They're on a five game winning streak right now. They potentially they're going to get probably get to the playoffs. I got them winning this weekend, and I, I'm extremely impressed with how A and T has bounced back from that really bad start. Losses to Central, losses to North Dakota State, lo lo losses to I, I believe it was uh, Duke was the other team they lost to. But man, they've been reeling off wins. The offense has looked impressive. The front seven is there. 
But uh, Tootin gets player, player of the week. Marcus Cooper, 183 on the ground, three rushing touchdowns, 8.3 yards per carry, and a big win for Incarnate Word over Texas A&M Commerce. It's been Lindsey Scott. It's been the Lindsey Scott show all season long. Marcus Cooper took it over this weekend at the running back spot and got the player of the week. And then Cole Doyle, St. Francis quarterback, completed almost 80% of his passes, 264 passing yards, and six total touchdowns this weekend. C Cole Doyle led St. Francis to a huge win over Sacred Heart this weekend. And right now, if you're doing a bracketology, looking ahead to the playoffs, the only team that is locked into a spot is St. Francis. That They clinched the NEC this weekend with their win over Sacred Heart, and Cole Doyle is a big reason for that. So Sacred Heart's run in the NEC comes officially comes to an end as St. Francis gets that, gets that auto bid this year. Now for Defensive Players of the Week, it, it's a runaway. Dalen Dotson, UT Martin defensive end, ran away with it. He might have only had five total tackles. He had two for loss, two sacks. He forced two fumbles, had two fumble recoveries, and a defensive touchdown this weekend for UT Martin. I, I just I just want to repeat that. Two tackles for loss, two sacks, two forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, and a defensive touchdown for Dalen Dotson for UT Martin this weekend. It is. It, it was amazing to watch this kid go out there and make play after play after play. Dalen Dotson, easily defensive player of the week. Armand Bailey and Dante Daniels are my two honorable mentions. Bailey had a big game for Sacramento State in a huge win over Idaho this weekend. While Dante Daniels leads Southeastern Louisiana to a big win and keeps their lead in it keeps their lead in the so um the Southland right now alive and well against um against Incarnate Word. They're going to have to win out if Southeastern Louisiana is going to make the playoffs. So those are my players of the week. Just just some notable scores. I'm not really going to break these games down. So I've mentioned the St. Francis win over Sacred Heart, 44 to 14 for St. Francis this weekend. They jumped out to a huge lead. The offense was unstoppable, and Sacred Heart really and truly is left with a lot of questions. They came in as the undisputed favorites, but that defense has just not been able to live up to the hype, and they have not been able to have any sort of offensive explosion this season. A huge game on the ground, too. Quayshawn Holmes, 168 yards rushing. St. Francis rushed for 304, and their quarterback threw five touchdowns. That, that's all you have to know about this game. St. Francis clinches their spot in the playoffs with a big win over, over Sacred Heart. Now, the game I was at, Elon, Delaware, you can catch the highlights on our channel. I had, a, I had an amazing time. I love North. I love that area of North Carolina, man. It is beautiful up there in the mountains. But Elon, a dominant win over Delaware, 27-7, to a top 15 upset. Elon came into this on a two-game losing streak, somehow found a way to knock off Delaware. It is... It, it was impressive the way they dominated the line of scrimmage, the way they were able to force turnovers and their ability to just be physical at the opponent's the attack and run the football was something that I did not see with Elon these past few weeks. Nolan Henderson came in a little bit banged up and I just, I just don't, th due to the fact they don't have a strong run game, I just think Nolan, Nolan Henderson not being at 100% really limited to what they could do offensively. And when you look at Elon, uh, running the football is so important, staying in those third and shorts. They went 12 for 17 on third downs and, cons and just consistently stayed third and threes, third and twos, and they would just hand it to the they would just hand it to the guy. Jalen Hampton is the player to note here. 136 on the ground, averaged over four yards per carry. Matthew McKay tossed three big touchdowns and the defense can force turnovers at the at the most opportune moments, man. So Elon gets a big win. I think this win probably keeps their playoff hopes alive. If Elon loses this game, no way Elon gets into the playoffs moving forward. They have two winnable games against U Albany and Hampton. I expect Elon to probably slide into the back end of that playoff and back into the playoff bracket after this win over Delaware. Now, uh, okay, we're gonna have to talk about this game. I'm still upset about this game. Tennessee State had everything in front of them. They were rolling. They've got healthy. They were they were winning. The offense looked explosive. The defense was coming along. They go up against 0-7 Murray State and get... I mean, I just want to put this in perspective. They scored three points, and the quarterback for Murray State had less than 90 yards passing. That should That's, that, that's all you need to know. That, that's all you need to know. Uh, Draylon Ellis sacked five times in this game, 
And Tennessee State, this was probably their worst rushing performance of the year. And I, I, I wonder, you know, Devin Starling I th- left the game banged up. He only had three carries for five yards. Jalen Rouse did a solid job in, in, in backup duty, 84 yards, ever six yards per carry. But the offensive line could not protect Draylen Ellis. They were they were giving up pressure all game long. And Draylen Ellis was running for his life. He had a solid game, 230. He, had, he did have a pick, though. But when you're getting sacked five times against a team that all season has not been able to generate pressure, it, it was disappointing to, to say the least. But, man, Murray State ran the football really well, 194, two touchdowns on the ground. J.J. Holloman for Tennessee State's legit. But outside of that, that I don't have anything for you. Cade Shepard for Murray State had three sacks this weekend. Just absolutely unblockable. That pick was taken back almost 50 yards, set up Murray State in great, in great field position in this one. It was just what was Tennessee State looking ahead? Was is Murray State better than I watching Murray State all year? I went back and watched some film because I, I went back and watched this game and I was like, man, I have not seen this from Murray State all year. I don't even know if this is a case that Murray State was just better than 0-7. I just think it was Tennessee State playing a horrible football game. I, I just – as soon as they were kind of – they were getting back on my good side in terms of <laughs> – in, in terms of maybe competing against the CMOs and the UT Martins in the coming week, yeah, it, any given Saturday, man, that, that's all you, you got to chalk it up to. They played – horrible football this weekend against Murray State. And this was big for Murray State. I believe also five winless teams won this weekend too. So if you were winless going into this weekend, you 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 definitely <laughs> you definitely are feeling better coming coming into this um weekend. I don't think this is worse than the lane loss. I mean listen losing to a D2 school is always worse than losing to a conference opponent even if they were winless. Um I still think the lane loss is worse, but they did have some injuries. This one was more inexcusable, though, in my opinion. Like, you had to have this game. You win this game against a winless Murray State team. You set up a game next week with SEMO and in two weeks against um, UT Martin. I mean, for the OVC, pretty much. And so now you're going to have to win out and hope that some things fall fall your way. I just I – mean, Tennessee State had it all ahead of them, and now – that now you're looking at the season as, as kind of lost it. I mean that that win over, that loss to Eastern Washington doesn't look great either. Now I mean Eastern Washington has not been has really missed Eric Berrier. So I think Tennessee State has a lot of figuring out to do. They are going to have to play better at the line of scrimmage if they're going to beat Semo next week. Semo is going to run try to run the ball straight down Tennessee State's throat. If they cannot protect the quarterback and can't establish drives, Semo is going to give Tennessee State a lot of problems next week. So. So, so that, that that's a that's a major problem moving forward. But uh, quickly, Utah Tech gets their first ever win in the WAC over Stephen F. Austin, forty-seven to forty-four. Gabalas at quarterback, five passing touchdowns, almost four hundred yards passing, and on top of that, Conley goes Conley goes for one thirty-one on the ground. This is a year that. Stephen F. Austin has failed to live up to any hype, but I wanted to give a shout out to Utah Tech on the show. We don't really talk about them as much. You know, they haven't had a lot to to address, but this win was huge for Utah Tech's program moving forward. It was a, it was an impressive win, and they needed this one. It was their first ever win in conference as well. So this was this was a big one for Utah Tech. Now, just for some of the top FCS games before we get to our HBCU recap, Weber State. Montana, uh, I, this is the team I thought was going to win. They, they got to Chris Brown. I said when Lucas Johnson was was deemed out of this game, I just didn't trust Chris Brown to make the plays. He threw for 72 total yards, was sacked five times, and they couldn't run the football. Montana got shut down. Weber State, it shows how good Montana State's rushing game is compared to what they did to Weber State last week. But Weber State held Montana to 42 yards rushing, 1.1 yards per carry. Dante McMillan goes for over 100. And we already know what Todd McPherson is, three for 84 and a touchdown. But that defense for Weber State is just on a different level. Winston Reed, Desmond Williams, uh, Stephen Bryant had three sacks this weekend. Eddie Heckard in the secondary played a good game. Maxwell Anderson had two big pass breakups, completely shut down one side of the field. I, I, I know they lost to Weber. I mean, they lost to Montana State last week due to the fact they gave up four safeties on special teams. I still think Weber State is, is a 
problem in the in, in the FCS playoffs. If they can fix that, fix those special teams problems, I think they can compete with almost anybody in that top five or that they're going to see in the corner finals moving on. I really do like Weaver State to give Sac State a big run for their money this upcoming weekend in a huge top five matchup. But for Montana, you're looking at if they're going to win probably their next two games. They don't play a really tough schedule, but the question becomes if they don't beat Montana State in the last week of the season, do they have the resume to get to the playoffs? And I don't know if they do. They don't have any signature wins on their resume. I mean, maybe a South Dakota is what probably their best win. And they squeaked by a really bad Idaho State team by seven points before they started this losing streak. If – if they don't beat Montana State, I really question if they have the resume to get in unless the committee gives it to them on brand recognition alone. I, I think right now, Montana is probably going to miss the playoffs if I had to guess at this moment. But these next three weeks are going to determine their season, and I think they do have to knock off Montana State at the end of the season or make that game extremely competitive to have a shot there on the bubble. Now, Sac State, Idaho – Giovanni McCoy is legit. I know Idaho didn't win this game, but for a true freshman, another 200-plus yard game, three touchdowns, no turnovers. Man, Giovanni McCoy is that guy. And the Idaho defense did what they need to do through the air, but the rushing game is just it's, it's just different. I said that I think Sac State can run the ball on anyone. Them and Montana State have two of the better rushing attacks in the entire country, and Sac State has run on everybody. Cameron Scadaba, 134 on the ground. Asher O'Hara, 127. They're one of the best duos in the country. 294, two touchdowns on the ground, over five and a half yards per carry for Sac State. That's that's the difference in the game. Is If you can beat Sac State, if you can slow down their run game, but if you cannot stop the, run, the rushing attack of Sacramento State, they are just going to eat up the clock and they're going to run the ball, football right down your, fo- down your throat and be so efficient on the offensive side of the ball that it's going to put a lot of pressure on your offense to, continu- con- to continuously score throughout the game. I already mentioned Armand Bailey had three sacks this weekend. Ian Moore, uh, Adelaide, Adelaide from Texas, the four-star transfer, had a big game as well. Sac State is a team that worries me in the playoffs just because they struggle at throwing the football. And are they going to meet a team in the playoffs when, when they see a South Dakota state, when, when, when they see a team like that, are they going to be able to run the football for 290, 300 plus yards? And that's, that's the question mark is the same question I kind of have about Montana state, not to this extreme, but I worry about Sac state's efficiency through the air, but defensively running the football in the offensive line, they're elite, and and it's just going to be a question mark of how far that rushing attack can take them in the playoffs this year. But huge win for them. They were, I think, they were a big favorite. I still think Idaho played really well. I didn't drop them very much in my top twenty-five, but Sac State another ranked win on their resume, man, and they are rolling into the playoffs. I think they've probably locked up a seed at this point already. They're going to be a top eight seed in the playoffs now. A big upset, Furman knocks off a top-10 team in Chattanooga. Now, Chattanooga did not have their all-conference running back. I lean forward. He was he was ruled out right before the game due to an undisclosed injury, but Furman put it on Chattanooga this weekend on the ground. They they held Preston Hutchison, forced two interceptions for him. Geno Appleberry played a good game in, in a replacement of Ford, but he just wasn't the guy. I mean, he had 56 yards rushing, only averaged about two and a half. But Tyler Huff is the player of the game. He played a hell of a game. And some of the in that loss for Furman against Sanford, Tyler Huff was banged up and missed that game. So they only have one FCS loss. Right now, Furman's loss are to Sanford and Clemson. That's it. That's why Furman was the biggest riser in my poll this week. Tyler Huff goes for 200 through the air, a touchdown, and also rushed for 132 and another touchdown. Devin Abrams also did his thing on the ground for the Palatins. And in terms of wide receiver, in terms of receiving, Ryan Miller is a legit NFL tight end. There's a, such great tight ends in the FCS this year in terms of Ryan Miller, Tucker Kraft, um, he, he, even Kamari Everett and Bethune Cookman, there are multiple tight ends that I do think can play away, um, you know, play their way onto a roster at the next level. The tight end spot, in my opinion, is one of the deepest positions in the FCS. There are a lot of guys who I think could be Sunday players at the tight end spot. But Furman, 24-20 win over Chattanooga. You have to think 
I said this earlier. I said this last week. If Chattanooga doesn't have their run game, can Preston Hudges and win them the game? He played really well against Mercer last week, but also a lean forward went for over 100 yards on the ground, and they were able to be really balanced. Can they do it when Ford doesn't have his best game or Ford is out? Right now, there's a big question mark due to this loss, but Furman, Chattanooga, Sanford, and Mercer are four teams from the SOCON that all have a path to the playoffs, and they all have to play each other moving forward. In two weeks, November 12th, that week of the same weekend, Jackson State plays Alabama A&M. Furman travels to Mercer, and Sanford, and Sanford travels to Chattanooga, and then the week after, Sanford uh, ultimately hosts Mercer in, in that final week of the season. So there are some huge games coming up for the SoCon and then quickly William and Mary squeaks out a big one against Rhode Island a huge goal line stand by the tribe to pull this game out Kasim Hill for Rhode Island had a big game Marquise DeShields also 7.3 yards per carry for Rhode Island but it came down to just the rushing attack of William and Mary once again Bronson Yoder Malachi Amoa also Donovan Lester did his thing Hollis Mathis they had four guys that hit about the 50 yard mark and Bronson Yoder and Malachi Amoa combined for over 200 plus yards two touchdowns and both of them averaged over seven yards per carry Malachi averaged 10 yards per carry for for the tribe this weekend William and Mary's rushing attack is so they in my opinion they have a, a very by committee approach and it works to it, it works week in and week out and I don't understand how this staff continues to be so creative with their play calling if, if you haven't had a chance yet I know a lot and I said this I believe last episode if you haven't had a chance I know a lot of y'all did a film study on Campbell and watched the William and Mary game just find you a William and Mary game this year to watch and look at how creative their offensive coordinator is in key situations, even though they're running the football, and they had 45 rushing attempts this week. Just look at how they create those opportunities for their running backs and and their skill players. They are able to put their put their players in the best situations in the most creative ways. And I think they have one of the best play callers in the FCS by far. And this is why I think they are really a sleeper in the FCS playoffs moving forward. I think William and Mary has a defensive line to cause a lot of havoc, and they have a run game that's going to be really hard to stop. The question mark becomes. Can Darius Wilson at quarterback be a game changer if the run game is taking away? If, if taken away, that's that's the biggest question mark for me. We, we know we know what the run game is with, with the, um, with, with with just the stable the backs they have. We know what the front seven is with Nate Lynn and John Pius, but you, it's just I. Uh, the, the quarterback is such a big question mark, and that's that's some. I'm going to talk about it more in my bracketology. There are, um, there are some teams in the playoffs that are ranked high that I don't know if they have that it factor at quarterback to win, and and that's and that's the question mark for me. But let's get to some of the HBCU games and we get to our games of the week. I appreciate you becoming a member. I definitely appreciate that. Um, I, I called this one. I can say I called this one. The other ones we'll have to talk about, but I, I, I like this one here. Alabama State pulls off a fourth quarter comeback over Alabama A&M, ends the streak 24-17. to 17. And the, the, I, I love how Maynard, Maynard was a good sport about it, and they were even still trash talking in the press conference today, and I love it. They were able to shut down Donovan Eaglin, and I said on the round table. The key was going to be to put the game in the quarterback's hand for Alabama A&M. And, it, and, and I talked and I asked Connell Maynard about Quincy Casey's performance, and he said, yeah, listen, he made some plays, but he made mistakes in key situations. And that ultimately means – that also that ultimately cost you more than making, than making some of those routine plays that he did. Because, I mean, he went 16 for 21, 217, a touchdown, but was sacked three times, made some bad decisions late with the football, and – that ultimately became the difference in the game. Now, for Alabama State, God just say this: Colton Adams is going to be a first-team All SWAC selection at linebacker. Him, I don't care if you're an SID voting, if you're whoever votes in the All SWAC. If Colton Adams and Aubrey Miller aren't the first two linebackers on your ballot, then you don't you you shouldn't get a vote. There's nobody even close in terms of Colton Adams and Aubrey Miller at, at linebacker in the SWAC. It's, it's not even a debate, not a discussion. There's nobody even close to either of those to either of those players at the linebacker spot. Colton Adams, a num- another 15-plus tackle game, had a tackle for loss, 
Adrian Maddox, again, man, this kid is special. And I really like how his game is developing. Also, Brandon Gaddy had another big game, uh, eight-plus tackles and some tackles for loss for the front seven of, Al of Alabama State. It was just, man, the defense made plays when they needed to. I picked Alabama State because, one, I, I did trust D. Davis a little bit more than any of the other quarterbacks. He had a, he went super efficient, but threw big, two big touchdowns for, for this offense. They weren't able to run the football. I was really surprised that Alabama State wasn't able to run the football as well against Alabama A&L, but, man, they made the plays. Eddie Robinson Jr. is just ooze confidence in the press conference. Uh, earlier today, and they just made the plays to win. I think AM collapsed down the stretch, and I, th I still think Alabama State was a better team all around. I, I really do. I, I know some Alabama AM fans aren't going to agree with me. I think the better team won. Even though they were they were down early, I think down the stretch, it, they showed that they were a winning team. Also, Zarion Hayes for AM had a big game, four and a half tackles for loss for him, led AM in tackles. I wanted to give him a shout out because he was by far the most dominant defensive player for the Bulldogs, but a huge win for the Hornets. And Grambling Alcorn State. Oh, all right. We're going to have to address this because I, I, I want you guys to – let's look at this a little, you know, and in, in not, not a vacuum, but let, let's take these past two weeks down um, for Alcorn State. The past two weeks, they – have outgained their opponent by like 200 plus yards. They have won the third down battle. They have won the time of possession battle. They have, they've won every major key statistic for the past two weeks and have lost both games and lost this one by almost 30 points. And if you didn't go back and watch this game, it, it would. Because I, I don't even think it, it's just so hard to say. Because I mean, Grambling played in a horrible offensive game. The fact that they have 35 points blows. I had to go back and watch this game in totality because I, I was kind of going through doing some research for this episode. And I was like, 35 points, and they had less than 300 total yards. And they went, what, one for 11 on third downs. And they lost the time of possession battle by almost 20 minutes. Like there's no, there's no way they should have lost this game. But then you look at the turnovers and the special teams and it's the same thing week in and week out that keeps costing all corn these games. And you, and you have to wonder eventually when, when is all corn and Fred McNair going to start correcting some of these things. It just seems like they're rolling down a hill and the momentum has not just, has not stopped for them since since that since that loss against Southern. It just every week it seems like they find a new way to to lose a game. They allowed four sacks on both their quarterbacks. They 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 ran the ball for 176, but they weren't necessarily efficient with it. Less than less than three and a half yards per carry. Jarvion Howard was held to almost three yards per carry, which is way, way below his average. Maurice Washington did his thing, 67 yards rushing, a touchdown average over seven and a half yards per carry. But I, I've really, Alcorn's also got to find some depth at wide receiver. I will say that. Juan Anthony had a big game, six receptions, 83 yards. But since Bowler's been out, they, they, they don't have that guy outside of Juan Anthony who can go make a play. Bowler is their big playmaker, but with him being out, no one has really stepped up to fill that secondary role yet. And and that's the biggest that's the biggest question for Alcorn State. And it's just week after week they find a way they find a way to shoot themselves in the foot. Lewis Matthews though has played excellent for Grambling all season long. Had another big game, thirteen total tackles, two for loss. Joshua Reed, uh, Sunday out of Anderson finally had a breakout game, two and a half sacks, three and a half tackles for loss. Myron Store and Ray Estes were the two big interceptions um, for Grambling. It was just. Time after time, anytime Grambling's defense or special teams had to make a play, they made it. That pick six was huge, and I think that just – it sucked the momentum right off that Alcorn State sideline. And you got to give Grambling credit. They didn't play a, They didn't play an A game, a B game, or a C game. They probably played like a D-plus game, but came out with almost a 30-point win. you got to give them credit. Alcorn right now, you're looking ahead. PV this week. You still got Jackson State on the schedule. It could be – it could be a long November in Lorman, Mississippi. I'm just going to put it – that's as nice as I can put it. It's going to be a long, long November in Lorman, Mississippi if things don't start turning um, turning around, to say the least. But A&T, 
huge comeback win against Campbell. I I, I was kind of keeping up with this game when I was at um <laughs> when I when I was covering the game because this game kicked off right before the Elon Delaware game. It was twenty eight to ten at halftime. I mean Campbell was dragging ant early and ant puts up 35 second half points that holds campbell to 10 to come out with the 45 38 victory it was it i have not seen this team respond to adversity like they did this weekend jalen fowler did his thing 233 two touchdowns but it, it came down to one one man and one man only but shield tootin i just mentioned player fcs player of the week consensus 30 carries, 256, two touchdowns, eight and a half yards per carry. Wesley Graves also had a big day, averaged over nine yards per carry in terms of the backup quarter, backup running back. And they were just, they were able in the second half. I don't know what adjustments exactly Sam Washington made. I need to get to that big, I need to get the Big South press conference, man. They made great second half adjustments. Also, Zachary Leslie. If you watch the press conference with Coach Mentor, he mentioned Leslie was a matchup nightmare on the outside. And he absolutely could not be stopped. Four catches, 124, and two touchdowns for AT. They were not able to hold him in, in any regard from getting what he wanted all game long. The wide receivers for AT are much more impressive than I was expecting coming in. Also on the defensive side, they did they did their best to slow down the rushing attack of Campbell, especially in the second half. A lot of the stats you see Campbell had, it was it was all first-half stats. In the second half, they were able to sh- slow down the run game, put Hodge Malik in bad situations. They sacked him three times, and it was it was just an, an absolute clinic in the second half of A&T. If you just want to see great adjustments, go watch the second half of this game because A&T did everything they were supposed to do. And i got to give them credit because a lot of teams down 28-10 to 10, – a crucial game. Campbell's running the football well. Hodge Malik's making play after play through for 400 yards. It was so it, it was easy just to kind of roll over and say, man, we just don't have it today. But the fact that they were able to come back out there with the adjustments, put up 35 points in the second half, AT answered the bell. And I think they are going to find a way to make the playoffs this year. I do have them winning this weekend. And, and I think looking at the rest of their schedule, I don't see an L. Moving forward for A T. so I expect A T to get that uh, that at um, auto bid from the Big South by winning the conference. Now, another game. I'm, I'm I'll be honest. I didn't see this one coming. If you would have told me South Carolina State would get back on track, upset North Carolina Central last week, and then come out and lose by almost thirty points to Morgan State. I don't know how much I would have bet you, but I know it was more than I was probably willing to lose looking back right now because I, I I would have never saw this coming, especially the point total. I was following on my phone at, at the Elon game, and I was like, man, that's got to be a typo. It has to be flipped. And it goes back to what I said last week, man. Corey Fields, Cor- like he looks, he, he looks amazing against North Carolina Central and then comes out against Morgan, 12 for 31, throws two picks, and then they rotate a few quarterbacks, and they have one quarterback, uh, Franklin, one for five with a pick and was sacked twice. That so- South Carolina State has to play better, especially in terms of their offensive line. Their offensive line was getting handled, absolutely handled this game. Morgan State's defensive line big boyed them all game long. South Carolina, stop me if y'all have heard me say this on the show. South Carolina State could not run the football. They, they've rushed for less than 100 yards, only three yards per carry. And if it wasn't for J- Alex James, who had one explosive play, Kendra Flowers, 30, 31 yards rushing, 2.2 yards per carry. And that was it. They could not run the football. They got beat at the line of scrimmage at the point of attack for 60 straight minutes. And every and when you look at Morgan State, Alfonso Graham is going to be a first team all um all MEAC selection. 123, two touchdowns, average over six yards per carry. Alfonso Graham was the difference maker. When you look at the games that they've lost, Alfonso Graham was taken out of the game early. And the fact that South Carolina State against a one-dimensional Morgan State team, because they cannot throw the ball, got absolutely drugged from us 200 yards rushing. 
it is an indictment on, on the team. Shaq Davis, three for 66, that's great. They don't have any other weapons on the outside. If you guard Shaq Davis, South Carolina State is, is, is just dead in the water. Morgan completed seven passes, guys, and scored 41 points. I repeat, they scored 41 points, and their quarterback went seven for 25 for 138 and two picks. That... That's that. That's just insane. Uh, that inex inexcusable to say the least. Uh, the that doesn't it, it doesn't even seem right. They got held to. They got held to two hundred and fifty yards of total offense against Morgan, man. And you got to you got to give Damon Wilson his credit. Yeah, he that team. When I watched that Central game, when I watched it on Thursday night, ESPNU in front of the whole. <laughs> in front in front of the whole world out there on ESPN uh, ESPNU I did not see this in in this defense Davius Richard went just crazy against him and I was like man maybe that defense wasn't all it was chalked up to be but man they that, that, that that's what I'm saying Sonic Boom how did how did Central not figure out the same weaknesses that 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 Morgan did and it just it goes to show you how much one a coach like Damon Wilson means to this program. Um, I, I just want to say this. It, if he gets a recruiting class or two into Morgan, I love the future of where Morgan State's going with this program. The fact that they were able to beat Sacred Heart this year, the fact that they were able to knock off South Carolina State like they did, the fact that if they keep winning, they got a chance to win the Mihak still. I mean, everything's still in front of them. In year one of Damon Wilson, they have quarterback trouble. Their only offensive weapon is Alfonso Graham. The defense is playing lights out in big moments. Man, Morgan State is way, way, way ahead of schedule. And so you've you got to give Damon Wilson his props, man. Uh, you really do. They were able to force a bunch of turnovers. They were able to make key – they were able to – be in the red zone and put points on the boards, and, that, and that's that's what it came down to. They held one for three for South Carolina State in the red zone. It it, it was impressive, man. I, I think this, and I put it, I put it on um, our Twitter. This was one of the biggest wins of the weekend, in my opinion. This was a huge win for Morgan, even if they don't win the MEAC. This was just one of those, and, and I'm sure anyone who's watched a lot of football can can you know find some examples of this that's happened when new coaches step in. And especially successful ones, there's always that moment in year one, year two, where people say that was the win that changed the culture around the program. That was the win that started all of this. And this is one of those program defining and tenure defining wins for Damon Wilson and Morgan State. So, man, huge, huge performance for, for the Bears this weekend. And, and I think this was the, this was one of the more surprising wins of the weekend. Now. Before we our two games of the week, Holy Cross Fordham, Jackson State Southern. We'll talk about Holy Cross Fordham first. I know I tell y'all to go look up a lot of stuff, but if you did not watch this game live, please do me a favor. As soon as I hit in broadcast, go find some highlights, go find the rerun, go to ESPN Plus and find um and, and somehow find this game somewhere to watch. This was the game of the year in FCS, and I think even possibly FBS. This was the game of the year. I'm telling you, 53-52, and if you don't know what happened, overtime, Fordham goes down and scores, 52-45. Holy Cross scores. They've run a, a, they've run a Holy Cross special run the reverse, the quarterback's open, the defensive end crashes. Instead of just throwing to the quarterback who was wide open, they ran it in, and, and, and that was how they won the game, on a reverse, on a reverse Holy Cross special or, or Philly special, um, whatever you want to call it. It was insane. Tim DeMoret had a crazy game again, five touchdowns for Tim DeMoret and Fordham, no picks again. Matthew Solka, though. I told you guys on the preview, I thought he he could compete with Tim DeMora at 291, four touchdowns through the air, and had 174 on the ground and a rushing touchdown. Matthew Solka was by far the player of the game. And I know Fordham and Tim DeMora get this, uh, they get this label as they're just an air raid, um, they're an air raid offense, and that all they do is throw the football. 
I just want to let y'all know, Tim DeMorant might have had five passing touchdowns. Fordham rushed the ball 39 times in this game, and Julius Lowridge rushed for 121 in a touchdown, and Trey Sneed rushed for 104, averaging over 5.8 yards per carry. They were balanced. They ran the ball more than they threw at this game. So this idea that Fordham is just an air raid offense, and that's why Tim DeMorant's stats are inflated, they run the football <laughs> a lot. And so I just want to make sure people know that because people always say, well, you can't compare – all these stats to to other players. I'm telling you, man, Tim DeMoret is that guy. And Matthew Solka played a hell of a game and just made one play down the stretch that that changed the whole game. Also, I got to give Jalen Coker his, his shine. I, I don't know how many people know about the film or the story of, of Jalen Coker. This kid is a dog. Six catches, 131, three touchdowns this weekend. And, and if you remember, Jalen Coker is the same one that's caught both Hail Marys for Holy Cross. Him and Sulka's connection is foolproof. It, it Every game he's getting five-plus catches and is going to have a touchdown. And Holy Cross just found a way to win the game. And this, this was two good teams, and I agree here. I, I think both of these teams this weekend proved that they belong in the playoffs. I, I, I do. I think... Fordham proved that they can compete with, with some of the top teams in the FCS. And I think Holy Cross can do the same. I know it's the Patriot League and it has that perception of, of a bad league. But, man, the, both of these teams are playoff teams. And you can't convince me otherwise. Fordham would beat some beat a lot of those teams on the bubble, in my opinion. And Holy Cross, I think, is probably going to be a seed. But I do think Fordham, in my opinion, should get in. Now, do I think they do? Ao, that's a different conversation. We'll have to see what happens and this is an interesting point too that Fordham running back I just mentioned from Houston Texas Texas Southern Mr. Opportunity to land a kid right out of Houston that went to Fordham and just had like a hundred plus yards against the number five team in the in the country. So uh Patriot team has has some teams Fordham is dangerous. I agree man but let's get to this one. Oh my lord you know if <laughs> If I didn't have to be super professional, I would have just put a I would have, I would have just put an egg next to Southerners. I almost left it blank for y'all just so y'all didn't have to see the pain of seeing the zero again. This this was dominant. Right, that's just Jackson State's defense is for real. Jackson State's defense is dominant. Jackson State's defense has playmakers everywhere, and that's it. And I. I I said, man, the matchup worried me. And that's what happened. At Bashan McCray, nine for 26, 85 yards and a pick. Not going to work. They rushed for 136 yards, but only averaged about three yards per carry. And just, just so y'all know, Gerard Sims had 52 yards rushing on one carry. So he averaged 52 yards per carry. You take that away, Southern rushes for less than 100 yards and probably about one point eight or nine yards per carry. Just throwing that out there. I mean, if it, it was for, it was one explosive run for 52 yards that, that saved the quote unquote stat box for people who didn't watch this game. Savion Wilkerson did what he, we know what he is. And Shador showed his athleticism when he got out of the pocket. I think he had 52 yards rushing, two rushing touchdowns and Dallas Daniels, obviously leads Jackson state in receptions. And I told y'all before the season, I said, I think Dallas Daniels is the only wide receiver that on this Jackson State team that can make a run at 100 catches and 1,000 yards receiving. I thought he was the only receiver that could do it because I thought every game he was going to be the guy that got the targets and it had the opportunities. And right now he's sitting at 50 catches on the year and almost 600 yards receiving. And I don't know if he's going to get to, a, you know, I don't think he's going to get to 100 catches or anything like that, but he's going to lead Jackson State in both yards and catches this year. And I told y'all, man, that experience and his ability to play multiple wide receiving positions and fill multiple roles is something that I didn't think I, I didn't think anybody else really had. And I, I think, uh, Diamond, I, I do agree there were some drops, but I do think that sometimes you chalk that up to the weather. I, I wasn't there, but there were some people there that said it, it was ugly all day. And I know y'all had the rain delay down there in Jackson. I do think some of those you could just kind of chalk like in, in a in a weather game like that, you're gonna have drops. I don't think I would I wouldn't hold that I wouldn't hold that against him necessarily. Um 
But I just I just think it it comes down to one thing. And I think Southern did some things well. Jalen Campbell had a huge game for them. I think he had four and a half tackles for loss, ten tackles and a sack. Um it was it, it was an impressive performance for him. I thought you know, Trey Lang had a few tackles for loss. I thought Derek Williams and Jordan Carter played really well for them, but the offense was just atrocious. You could say what you want, and you could say the what ifs, and you could say, well, you know, if this play went differently, if they blocked this guy or or et cetera. The the fact of the matter is you got held to less than 225 total yards in offense. As an offense, you averaged less than three and a half yards per per play. And you had you you couldn't establish any consistency on the offensive side of the football. I, I mean, three of eighteen on third downs, two of four on two of four on fourth downs, and you didn't even hit. You didn't even get to the red zone. That should tell you all you need to know. Like I get it. If you went to the red zone, you turned it over. You know, you could say what if, what, what if this, what if that. You you didn't even get to the red zone. I, I can't. That's that's all you need to know about how this game is. I, I think the offense for Jackson State they they didn't. Um, they, I don't think this was Jackson State's best offensive game. I'll just say that I don't think Jackson State fans in here think that either. But. The defense is so good. I'm, I'm just saying that if, if Jackson State gets to 20, man, it, you got you don't have a chance to win. That that's just that's just as simple as it is. If 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 Jackson State gets to 20, and really and truly, if they get to 17, it's it's over. What they're allowing, I think nine or eight or nine points per game. I that's it. I'm, I'm just I, the, the this the storyline of this game for me. I don't even matter about anybody else's stats. Shador, um, Savion, Dallas. It came down. It came down to Jackson State's defense just being that good. It, it it is outrageous how how talented they are. And next week against Texas Southern, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with y'all. I don't see that game being very close. I I I, I don't. I, I love listen. I love Miss Body. I love Andrew. All of them. I, I don't think they have the weapons on offense to to compete. I I, I don't. I I think it's a terrible matchup. I think the offensive line that has had problems protecting Andrew this year, outside of Drake Centers, who's 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 legit. I, I don't I don't see how that game's close. To be honest with you, and I agree. I don't. Know, Southern made Shador like Michael Vick out there. That, that's it. it. It was just it was just a bad overall game for Southern. I think you could tell Dooley was um, Dooley was a little bit fed up in, in the press conference today with everything and him being uh, I, him being shut out as an offensive minded head coach. I I really I really think I, I, that called him off guard. I I really don't think they they thought anything about it. And I know someone. Um, messaged me so you know I, I didn't get to watch this game live i was covering another game so i went back and watched and i haven't really been on social media just due to traveling and also the auburn news breaking i just haven't had a lot of time to look around what exactly happened with the southern quote uh, someone um messaged me and said that there were some southern players that said they were going to rob shador or something like that listen y'all can call in and tell me um seven seven zero one seven seven nine nine five eight five but i didn't i didn't see the video or see exactly what happened but i know there were some people that were upset about it um and that that it won it wasn't asked in the press conference or anything either so i don't know exactly what happened i was just going to see um uh what what happened exactly uh okay they tried to snatch his chain Yes, it's on YouTube, and we need some suspensions. I had four SU fans sitting behind me and told me, and they were quiet as hell. They tried to snatch his chain on the field. Mm. Pre-game video trash talk through social media. Gotcha. Okay, I, I didn't know because there were some Jack State fans that reached out to me that were pissed about it, so I I didn't know what happened. Um, I, I'll watch it after the live stream and give my thoughts on the recap on Wednesday. But... Um, there were some people really upset about that, and I know some some of the <laughs> some some of the fans were really really uh, uh, not ha- not pleased with that to say the least. Jackson State barely scored twenty two points against Campbell and Ant dropped forty eight. On it was more impressive. Ant doesn't have a five star and still get the job done. Mm, trying to rob rob him of his chain after getting washed like laundry shameful. <laughs> oh, it was Trey Lang. Oh. 
I summoned the commission to investigate. Well, I know, I don't know if y'all saw the press conference. I don't know how many people watched the press conference. Just a note, Mississippi Valley State's missing four players from the uh, from the post-game, uh, I, I believe it was against Bethune, the post-game fight with Bethune-Cookman. Uh, Valley has four players, according to Dancy, who are going to be suspended this weekend due to that post-game uh, event. So just wanted to throw throw that out there for people. But real quick, man, um, let me see. if Let me know if y'all can see that, man. I tried to make it as big as possible uh, for everybody, but this is the playoff bracket as of right now. Um, listen, South Dakota State, Montana State, North Dakota State, Sac State, Weber State, Holy Cross, UIW, William & Mary, would be my seeds right now, my top eight seeds. And then the matchups, I, I tried to match them all up. As, so the way in this way does it, there's going to be as many um, as many bus trip matchups as possible. So I have all of these are bus trip. Um, all of all of these are bus trip matchups except for two. And it's it's mostly because nobody's going to be close to Idaho or North Dakota in this. And then you also have that Davidson, New Hampshire one. Um, that is, they're both kind of in like that weird spot. But Sanford, Austin P, Elon Furman, Idaho, North Dakota, SEMO, Southern Illinois, Davidson, New Hampshire, North Carolina AT versus Mercer, Chattanooga, UT Martin, and Delaware versus St. Francis would be my first round matchups. My last four teams in right now would be Elon. I think you look at UAlbany and Hampton, I think they went out with, with multiple rank wins, including wins over William and Mary and Delaware on their resume. I do think Elon finds a way to get in Furman. I do think they get in, especially based on the fact they just beat Chattanooga. And I do think they can, pro they can probably split some of those last few SoCon games on their schedule. And I think Furman can get in, especially with, um, with the way that they've been playing down the stretch, man, that team is rolling. SEMO would be one of my last two in the North Dakota, just because they have one of the toughest schedules in the country. And their and their only game that they should lose moving forward is possibly the North Dakota state in the last week of the season. If they can just keep that competitive, I do think they get that last spot. First four out. I got Montana being the first four out. I don't see them beating Montana State this year. I don't think they have any quality wins. I think it's going to come down to them in North Dakota. And the fact that North Dakota is going to have two ranked wins on, on their resume, I give the edge to North Dakota over Montana at this point. Now, if Montana somehow finds a way to beat Montana State, this could be a different conversation. And Fordham, I wish they were in. I think they should be, but I just don't think the committee is going to give them that benefit of the doubt, and they're going to be one of the first four out. Richmond, I have them. They potentially could lose their last three games. New Hampshire, Delaware, William & Mary, I think all three of those could potentially be losses. I just don't see Richmond finishing the year very strong, so – I would I, I think Richmond's gonna fall to the first four out. And then Fam U would be my fourth team out. They're probably gonna be sitting at nine and two. Potentially, you know, if they lose to Southern, they're not even in the first four out. But the problem with Fam U is they don't have any real quality wins on the resume, especially after South Carolina State just got drugged by Morgan State. I just I think when you look at those last four in, they have a lot more quality wins um than Florida AM. And the, the reason I don't have Central, I think Central is going to find a way to get into the Celebration Bowl. I don't trust South Carolina State to win out, especially after what happened this past weekend against Morgan State. So the reason I don't have Central in here is I do think they find a way to win the MEAC. Now, if that changes, Central probably would be in my playoff bracket as of right now. But at, at, as my bracketology sits right now, this is only Bracketology 2.0, I have Central winning the MEAC, and that's why they're not, they're not in there. And um, I think in terms of first round matchups, man, that A and T Mercer matchup would be insane. That's that's one of my favorite matchups. I also love the Sanford versus Austin P matchup, and another another one that's kind of a a rivalry type game almost because I mean I think they're only like thirty or forty miles apart. Is Semo versus Southern Illinois, man? Those schools are right around the corner from each other. I think that game would be a giant game. In that in in that in that Missouri Illinois area, over there. But um, man, this would be my bracket as of right now. I know a lot of people were asking for it, but this is how I see the playoffs shaping up as of today. I'm going to do an updated one each week moving forward. But the next one, next slide is probably going to rub a few people the wrong way. 
We got the top 10 HBCU rankings, and we had a lot of movement. I'm just going to be honest. I was planning on doing this last week, and we had a giant – Set up, we had a giant movement in the HBCU rankings. I got Jackson State. If, if you don't have Jackson State number one in your rankings, nobody's taking you seriously. Just gonna throw that out there. Jackson State's won by a landslide. I still have Central over AT and FAMU. I think Central right now, even with that loss to South Carolina State, is is still it's still better. They got the head to head win over AT. So that's why I'm putting Central at two. I got AT at three. They've been the hottest team in I had the hottest team. They're the hottest team right now. One of them in the country, man. Five straight wins. I think I am in a head to head right now. I would pick AT over FAMU in a head to head game which is why I got them slightly ahead of FAMU. And also their strength of schedule has been brutal. And when you take their three losses, I don't think I don't think FAMU beats any of the three teams that beat a and I, I really don't. And because uh, if they if, if FAMU played North Dakota State, Duke or Central right now, I don't I'm not picking FAMU to win any of those games just just right now. Southern I got it five. That they lost a big game to Jackson State, but Jackson State also drugged the number four team in my rankings, fifty nine to three. I still think I still think Southern's better than some of the teams behind them. So I got Southern hanging onto that fifth spot. Alabama State at six. They just won the Magic City Classic. They've won some big games this year. They're sitting in a really really good position to potentially make a push for second place in the, in the East right now, especially if they beat FAMU when they play in just a few weeks. PV at seven. I think they've done enough to, to keep that ranking. They dropped a spot, but I, I even though it was a close one against Bethune Cookman, I <laughs> it was a close one. I still think they're better than than Texas, and they beat Texas Southern. And then Howard at eight, right now number one in the MEAC. But I need to see Howard compete against some of the top teams in the MEAC before I move them any higher. So I got Howard at eight, Texas Southern at nine. They this week they really didn't do anything to move. And then South Carolina State at 10, they were almost out of my rankings. I'm going to be honest with you. After watching what they did to Morgan State, what happened to Morgan State, I, I, I think South Carolina State could have dropped out. But the problem is they do have that win over Central to pad their resume. Hampton's falling apart in the CAA, so you can't go them. Morgan State has two MEAC losses already, so you can't put Morgan State over South Carolina State just in terms of pure resume. Tennessee State would have been there, but losing to an 0-7 Murray State team, you can't be in the top 10. I'm sorry. And then, what, everyone else is just kind of thrown around, to say the least. I I don't know how y'all feel about... I don't know. Okay, you can... I get it. You can see FAM at two. NCCU, they, they, their two losses are the teams A and T beat. Here's here's the question though, Isaiah. They beat A and T by double digits. That they did, and so when when it's that close, you got to make fine decisions like that. And right now, Central's got a better record, and Central beat A and T, so I can't. I, I can't put A&T over Central right this second. I, I I just I can't do it. You know, he said I'm bewildered that Howard has a chance to. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, I the MIAC right now, the MIAC right now is insane. Right now, I think it, if I'm not mistaken, almost everybody has a still has a chance to win, in, in some capacity, and if Howard finds a way to win this weekend. Jesus Christ! I, I'm I'm just I'm just saying it, it's going to be pure chaos if Howard finds a way to get to the 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 celebration bowl because they did what Alcorn said they were going to do last year. If you think about it, if Howard makes the celebration bowl, they started their season in the A with a loss of the swag, and they're going to go to the celebration bowl and probably catch an L to the swag again against Jackson State. <laughs> and um. And also that that's what I'm saying here. But Central also has the best out of conference win too. That's another big reason. Thank you, Paris. New Hampshire is like top 15 in the country right now, and they beat them to death on the road. So I, I think right now Central and AT and FAMU, those three teams are all really, really close. I'm just I'm listen, two through four can all be switched around. Central has the best out of conference win. AT is undefeated in conference and fam and FAMU right now. 
has been on a big winning streak out, outside of that Jackson State loss. So that's why those teams are ordered like that. But listen, I get it. a and Central, you can argue back and forth. But I think Central's out-of-conference win over New Hampshire is the best team. It's the best out-of-conference win out of any of that any of these teams have. So that's that's also another defining point. But I, I would like to see a and and Central play now. I'll, I'll be honest. I do think it would be a different game, especially with the – especially with – a and T now committing to the run, and also their wide receiving unit. It seems to be gelling at the right time, but hey, we'll never know, man. It took the L week one. I agree, but that out of conference win for New Hampshire is saving Central as of right now. Oh, he said we want South Carolina. Why y'all keep predicting the death of the Celebration Bowl? Uh, that must be someone in the chat. I don't think anyone. I don't think anyone has uh predicted that. They don't have to beat you again. They beat you. <laughs> I ain't going to lie. JSU will have a field day over Howard. Oh. Okay. That Here's the question. Um, Because, because listen, I, I, I'll defer to you guys because because you guys in the chat probably know a little bit more about fan base traveling than I do. If Howard found a way to get to the Celebration Bowl against Jackson State, we know Jackson State's bringing their allotment of fans. That, that is what it is. Would ha- would Howard travel to the Celebration Bowl well? They traveled pretty well to the Swag Miak Challenge, but do you think they would travel to the Celebration Bowl? Just, just, just my. I, I just wanted to ask you guys because I, I don't know personally, but I don't know what their fan base. I know people mess with them about their fan base a lot, but I just wanted to know. Two, three, eight, eight. You're live. Double T, double up. What's good, man? Hey, Blue. Um, well, how we go, traveling to the Celebration Bowl? The fans, they may not, because Howard is not playing good football. Like most MEAC fans, especially, they not going to. They only travel if the, their teams are playing good football. If Howard was playing good football, or the fans think they playing good fo- football, they'll be down there. Like they like Howard fans will be there. Like. How with all the other MEAC schools, like whenever their team's playing good football, like they pack, like they following their team. As far as the celebration bowl, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be dead in two years. I would already got an invite to the CAA and um don't uh it's another team too. I can't think of it off the top of my head. It's two teams that's already considering leaving the MEAC. So what's gonna happen when you got four teams left in the MEAC? I, I don't know. Uh, apparently, what I was told by someone is that there's a contingency plan, but they haven't announced what that is. I have no idea what the contingency plan is. because I think you're thinking about Morgan potentially to the NEC. I think that's the other offer that you're thinking the about. Other one. Yeah, that's probably it. I ain't going to say Morgan as a definite one. I know how would they most likely leave, almost definitely. So, and me saying it's a contingency plan, all the other conferences like Big South, CAA, or whatever, like CAA, they announced who they gave invitations to and who was coming to their conference and everything. So, like, come on, if you had some a contingency plan or some teams really coming, you would have said it. Every other conference says, oh, like the A song, they announced what teams was coming when they had them come, right? So, what's the yeah. contingency plan? Who are you going to get to come? Nobody comes. Virginia Union not coming. Bowie State not coming. You're not getting nobody to come. And who? what FCS team in their right man, mind will go to the MEAC right now? I, I don't know. I know this weekend when I was up in, uh, for that Elon Delaware game, they were talking about that Robert Morris, uh, Charleston Southern, and, and the, the rest of the Big South teams that aren't going to the CAA could potentially jump to either the MEAC, the OVC, or the SOCON. But I don't see the SoCon taking anybody. The the thing is with the MEAC, let's say it's just between the MEAC and the OVC. MEAC don't bring as much money as OVC does. So you are talking about teams leading the Big South? Is Big South brings in more money than the MEAC does for their teams? So like right off just off of that part, why would I go there? They're gonna bring in less revenue for. Them. So I'm gonna take a drop. I'm gonna pay the same fees for the BFCS to a conference that's doing nothing. And all the other teams are left, and two, and like teams are leaving. So if Howard and Morgan leave, why would I go there? 
No, I, I feel you, man. But hey, um, I'm gonna get to some of these other callers, man. But I appreciate you. All right, I'm gonna go, Mister Ford, three seven six nine and one five four seven. Mr. Ford, you're live. Hey, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah, listen, uh, that situation with the uh, MEAC is real. Uh, they had 20 years of nothing leadership from uh, Dr. Dennis Thomas. And after he leaves or retires or whatever, or forced out or whatever, you go and get somebody who worked directly on it. So you're doing the same thing over and over. So... I've said this, and I don't know, Blue, if you've heard me say this. I've said that what they need to do in the SWAC is come up with a contingency plan to take those teams into the SWAC. I know that most of you will say, well, what about the travel? That can be worked out. But I've said over and over that Dr. Charles McClellan and those needed to come up with a plan to get those schools, because I've always thought that the MEAC was going to fall because uh, – you know, I respect their football and all that, but their administration department, it was always terrible. You were talking about with Howard Travel. Listen, I've gone to all them, except the one last year. I, for three years, we watched Alcorn bring more people to the dome than North Carolina a and and A&T was the largest black university in America. Uh, they don't travel well in the MEAC. That, that's not a big thing with them. But... Um, it really doesn't matter who the MEAC brings. The main thing is the drawing card is Jackson. If Jackson comes to that celebration bowl, you guarantee a crowd of at least fifty to 60,000. It doesn't matter who comes from the uh, MEAC. If you can get Jackson in there, if Jackson's in it, it's going to be a big crowd. It's going to be a record crowd. Uh, listen, let me say this about this Southern thing. First of all, the people, the administrative people, and the people who run that athletic program at Southern are not reactive people. They're proactive people. Let me tell you something. That egg that they laid down there in Jackson last Saturday, don't think them people didn't see that. Don't think they ain't got over that Texas Southern thing out there in Arlington. I'm telling you now, because I, I went to Graham, but I know a lot of people at Southern. They're going to make changes on that defensive staff at the end of the season. Now, he might keep uh, Henry Miller and them because I mean, his homeboys and he's lawyer to and all that, but them people at Southern, they're going to make changes now. Because now, let me, I mean, like I told uh, CFL last night, they better be fam this weekend, and they better not lose the Gramlin uh, in that Bayou class. Because if they lose the Gramlin, baby, it's going to be major changes. Now, now, if they can win out here, it'll be a few changes. And the other thing I'm going to tell you, Blue, from what I saw Saturday, you know what? I think Prairie View might come back and win the, the Swag West. I'm going to be honest with you. I think Prairie View might come back and win that thing. And, uh, y'all, you know, I, I was telling some people last night, you can't tell me that that kid at Southern, that, what's his name? You call him what? Bash what you call him? What's his name? Bashan McCray. You can't tell me that's the best kid. That's the best quarterback at Southern. Ain't nobody can tell me that. I know that that kid is not the best quarterback at Southern. I, I, uh-uh. I know what Noah Biden can do. I know what that blood kid can do. I know what that Bubba McDaniels can do. You can't tell me that kid's the best quarterback down there. You can't tell me that. Nobody can tell me that. That kid is the best quarterback. The other thing is this. That Gerard, the, the kid, was it Gerard Sims? What's that running back name you said took yeah. off on the 52 yards? Yeah, uh, Gerard Sims. Okay. Now, on that play you're talking about, Nugget hit him in the knee. He didn't see Nugget coming, and Nugget took his knees out. He didn't come back. You you got an injury report on him? No, Dooley is uh, tight to the vest when it comes to that. I just know he's out indefinitely. Yeah, because I, I thought he hurt him. Because he, he, what he did, he gave him a body blow to his knee. He didn't see. Uh, he was in pursuit. He overtook him and threw his body into uh, Sims' knee. That was on that 52-yard run that you were talking about. Um, I tell you, now, I'm just going to be honest with you. I like Dooley. I love Dooley. But I knew that homeboy stuff was going to get him in trouble. And let me say this, too, uh, Blue. Let me tell you this. You got Alabama State at number six, and you got Southern at number five. Let me tell you something. Alabama State is a better team than Southern. Now, the only problem with Alabama State right now, like I told them people last night, 
Alabama State is an offensive coordinator, a quarterback coach, and a play caller from being a legitimate uh, threat to win the SWAC. That guy that, listen, let me tell you what I see. I, I watched that um, Magic City class. That pl- play calling they're doing, that's throwing something up against the wall and hoping it sticks. But see, what, what's going on at Alabama State, them boys play off of that Davis kid. They play off of him. But see, they don't have a system. That's the difference between he and Shadour. Shadour has a system. He has a play caller. He doesn't have a system at Alabama State. They, they just they just doing stuff. My Listen, if I could talk to Eddie Robinson, I would tell him, go back and get that Davis kids playbook from when he was out there in Texas in high school and go with that. That will be better than what that uh, – I, I think that guy's name is Harry Williams. And what's the offense coordinator's name yeah, at, at uh, I, Alabama State? I believe State? so. Isn't it Harry Williams? Yeah. Listen, that, listen um, let me say it again. Alabama State is a offensive coordinator, quarterback coach, play caller, away from being a legitimate threat to win the SWAT. Now, I, I, I don't know if y'all noticed it, and I said it to some people uh, some weeks ago. Alabama State was going blow to blow with Jackson State. You know when they fail? when they realized that Davis kid wasn't coming back because they had no confidence. That team didn't have no confidence in that Miles, what's his name, Carly, or what's his name, the kid from Atlanta. He went to Tucker High School. What's yeah, his name? Yeah, Miles Crawley. They didn't have no confidence in him. They play off of that Davis kid. I just hope and I pray that Coach Ed Robson don't, you, don't misuse this kid. You got a four- or a five-star quarterback. Please put around him the things that he needs. And let me say this about Shadour. Them runs that Shadour made in the second quarter, that guy, the, all of that stuff can be attributed to that strength and conditioning coach that they got from Georgia. That's why he, he's able to do that now, because they worked hard in the offseason, especially in the summer. You remember uh, I, told you, I told y'all, if you were listening, I said the people who take advantage of June and July whether it's on the field or off the field, it was going to show up. That's why it took off like that, because they worked him, they had him on that iron, and they had him uh, running them stands, and everything about him has changed. And let me tell you something, he's going to get better. But I'm saying the same thing can happen for that kid up there. at uh, Now, let me say this here. Uh, you were saying that Auburn don't want uh, Deion Sanders, and let me tell you something, Georgia Tech don't want him either, because uh, – Georgia Tech is bringing in where well, they got an AD who was uh, uh, an administrator over at um, Alabama. He's a graduate of North Carolina. Listen, he ain't coming here either. So uh, I'm like you, like you said about he ain't coming to Auburn. They ain't, they ain't bringing him to Georgia Tech either. You, Blue, you got any question for me? No, that's it, Mr. Ford. Appreciate you calling in. Okay, have a good night. You too. One Perfect. five Perfect. four seven. Oh You're live. Ooh. I'm right there. Uh, Ooh. Can you hear me? Yeah, you live, man. Okay. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say, you man, I appreciate you. Well, I'm, I'm from Greensboro, so I want to say, I appreciate you making me wrong about the game, man. I was there. I was lit. We was down 28 cents at that first quarter. I would leave myself, man. But I talked too much trash to Campbell last year, so I had to stick it out. So, after I watched that game, I loved it. Now, before he's left, I'm kind of going to say Mr. Ford, you owe a a big apology. Everyone saw you last week say, oh, Campbell going to blow a and a and ain't like that no more. But what happened? My boys came back, and they smoked them. The least you can do is apologize on this show and say you was wrong. That's all I want to hear, man. Just admit you wrong, man. I get it. You don't like answering people to me yet. But at least since you was wrong, say, hey, we still like that. And we ain't got no more. I got to hear something from you to comment or something, man. I mean, I'm just saying. Now, ask something else. I watched Ask You Blue. Uh, if Central does not make the Celebration Bowl, do you see a rematch with a and Central happening in the first round or not? 
okay, there's two ways to look at this. One, yes, because the matchup would be epic. I mean, we'll just put it like that. No, because pairing up two HBCUs in the first round prevent both teams from making a run, if that makes sense. I would rather mm-hmm. A&T go face you know, a Mercer and Central go face a Furman or something like that. And I would like to see both of those teams win and move forward. So as much right. as the matchup would be fun to see, if two HBCUs make the playoffs, I don't want them mm-hmm. to play in the first round. Okay. That makes sense. Oh, okay. one more thing. Uh, nothing with it to forward. Again, I understand he, I, he, 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 he's still going to say, but uh, one thing he said about Celebration Bowl was not true. a sold out tickets every single time he was there, and Alcorn didn't. I don't know where he got his, his number saying they had more fans than we did. That 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 cap. That's not true. a sold out tickets, I think, they started going when I was, when I was an undergrad there, around 15, 16. The first two weeks it was announced, Every time that happened, we were sold out. I couldn't get sick at all until after I graduated for AT. So, again, Mr. Ford, I need an apology from that. Uh, second question. Uh, I know it's, it's very unlikely. I know it's very hard for AT to win any kind of in the playoff. If somehow AT was able to have a rematch with North Dakota State, I think based on your bracket, that would be the semifinals, correct? Uh, hey, let me pull it back up. Um... Yes. Yeah. I thought it'd yeah, be, it, I could be wrong, it'd be the but, semifinals. Yeah. yeah, so if that were semifinals, do you think that would, I guess, have some sort of media buzz since, since how bad the game was this early this year? Yes, because I think people would be surprised that after the beating y'all took in week two, that y'all made okay. it to the semifinals. Because if you look at the bracket, if, if A&T made that run, they would have to beat Mercer, Incarnate Word, mm-hmm. And then probably Montana State all on the road, most likely. That would be an insane run. So, yes, the media attention would be there. Going to the Fargo Dome and winning again, uh, probably mm-hmm. not going to happen. Not, it, I don't know, I'm not going to be winning, but I, like I, said, that, I know it's like I said, kind of like we got some really good teams ahead of us. If we do make playoffs, but uh, like I said, I would love to see it. Again, love your work, Blue, love it, man. Like I'd come in and, like, I'm sorry. I, after Eric Mr. Ford said last week, I had to come in and make sure that I had to hold him accountable because you can't talk all that trash and be a hater against a t and then not apologize and not acknowledge that you was wrong. So like, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I get the hate. I get it. If you was right, but you was wrong. And I, want to at least, I want to at least admit that. And you did, so I do appreciate that, man. Hey, appreciate you calling in, man. Of course. Thank you. Seven nine zero nine. You're live. What's going on, Blue? Give me one second. Oh, you good, man. I'm going to cut this audio off real quick. Give me one second. All right. So I'm piggybacking about a t You should have came to g my man. You should have came to g Man, I don't even know about that. Holy Cross, like the fans wanted me to come to that Holy Cross game so bad. And I was like, man, it's so expensive to fly from Mobile to Worcester, uh, Massachusetts. And now, watching how that game turned out, I am so upset that I wasn't there. It, that was the game of the year, and I missed it. A lot of the alums are saying this is probably the best homecoming game of all time. That's the talk of the town right now. So, like, a lot of the older heads right now are trying to give them a historical perspective about it. Because typically, during homecoming games, you typically play a cupcake team. And the past couple of years, we haven't really done that. So, and considering the comeback and the and the day that Tootin had, they're saying it's probably the best one of all time. I knew we were going to be able to run the ball against Campbell. Even in the first half, we were now 2018, we were running the ball on him. But, you know, that was a hell of a comeback by a and I mean, so. I think Tootin has wrapped up the Big South Offensive Player of the Year race. I think it's his. I don't see anyone making a run for it. Really and truly, I have to you know go through and do a little bit more research. But off the top of my head, I think I, I think Tootin's going to win the Big South Offensive Player of the Year this year. He's got a couple more records to break. If he runs for 100 against Norfolk, he'll break another school record, the most 100 yard games in a season. Tariq Cohen has that with seven total. 
And uh, I think uh, he's got a shot to tie somebody in the Big South for 10 straight games, for 10 total in a season. So we might we might walk out of the Big South with a couple records, man. I'm looking forward to it. Hey, man, it was a big win for you guys. And I, I don't see y'all losing the game down the stretch. So I just need y'all not to get blown out in the playoffs, please. I, I can't I can't handle it emotionally. Uh-huh. So you, I don't, so I'm assuming that Mercer's probably going to get the home game if it falls that way. I don't, there's no scenario where a and could potentially play a home game. Is that accurate to say? I mean, it depends on how much I'll put up. I mean, how much, how much, you know, a and and the people behind the scenes, how much will they really put up to host a game? Realistically, like what would a oh, that, realistic bid, bid be? Oh, that's how them? it works. It's not, ba- it's not based on, it's not based on like your rankings. It's based on who's willing to put up what, how much money? Just the first round. Uh, once it gets to the second round, the higher seeded team hosts. But in the first round, both teams bef- before they even know who they're matched up against. So this is as soon as you're picked for the playoffs before the brackets announced, everybody puts a check like in this blank um, envelope. The committee has it. They make the bracket and then they put the envelopes together and whoever bid the most money gets to host the game. Oh, my goodness. I did not know that. I just learned something new. Wow. That's why James yeah, Madison. I don't know. I don't. James Madison was losing money before they were uh, the, you know, before they broke into the top eight C's. There were a lot of schools that were just putting just outrageous bids, but a lot of teams ba- bid based on ways they don't they don't lose a lot of money. If that makes sense. So like if they expect this sort of profit, they'll bid a certain amount based off that. Yeah, I don't. I'm gonna be honest. I don't see a. I could be wrong, and maybe that'll be a, a discussion point for the for the folks at Blue Dust Valley. But I don't see us raising that much money to put a bid in to get a home game because I don't think any teams in the in the sport of losing money either. So, I mean, yeah, and really wow. and truly, That's when good. you look at those That's teams enough. in South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, man, it really don't matter who hosts. I mean, the travel is gonna be nothing because. There's teams that are within 100 miles of everybody's campus. Like when you look at, I mean, A&T, Furman, um, all those teams in that area, even Elon, if they get in, I mean, they're all right there. That's an easy bus trip for anybody. Yeah, so I, did you have a chance to watch the game yet? Because I, I got yeah. a quick question I went, for you. I got yeah, I went back and watched it. a question for you involving Campbell. Yeah, go ahead. So there's been rumbling that Coach Mentor might be leaving after this year. The the to, rumor, go to another school locally. So the the I don't know if you've heard, heard anything in your streets or not, but there's been so, rumblings that he might head over to USC Charlotte. Yes. Which means that the quarterback will likely transfer. To an HBCU. So. Uh, so the reason that started to be a rumor is because his contract at Campbell actually ends after this year. But based on what I was told, Campbell's going to try to drop as big of a bag as they can to keep him. This is going to depend on whether Charlotte takes that chance or not. If if he if he gets the bag thrown at him from them. I, it's hard not to take that opportunity, but I don't. I don't know if they're going to yet because he doesn't have a winning record in terms of head coaching. I mean, listen, he's recruiting the hell out of uh, just this next upcoming class. But man, to jump from Campbell to Charlotte right now, man, that's a big risk for Charlotte. But you get that recruiting class. I can see both sides. I would bet though mentors at Campbell next year if I had if I had to guess. I kind of hope so because I I I said once the move from A and T going to C and then Campbell joining I said A and T and Campbell has the potential to be a big rivalry. A and T Elon already have something going on for years anyway, so you would already have a couple of games intact within the conference in the CAA anyway. So I've always felt like so, and I think with Mike Minner there with, with his Carolina ties, that's huge. Because he's a Panther legend, like he's like rolling on in Charlotte from that standpoint. He was on the Super Bowl team from '03. I just don't think so. Campbell. I don't think Campbell would have jumped to the CAA 
knowing they weren't going to extend um, Mentor? Why would you want to be going through a head coaching change and try to compete in the CAA? It just it, it would make no it, it wouldn't make a logical sense to me. But uh, you never know nowadays, man. But I, I think their whole plan is to keep Mentor around. Use these new recruiting classes to try to co- try to compete in the CAA early while they try to get their money up. Because you know, Campbell's been trying to invest a lot more money in their athletic programs, and they're going to have to mm-hmm. to compete at um, at the high level in the CAA. I mean, look at look at the top of the CAA right now. You got some studs up there in terms of programs. So they're going to have to put a lot more financial investment. And I can't imagine they're going to want to go through a coaching change year one in the CAA. There's more sports than football, though. I always got to remind folks of that because they got a damn good baseball team over in Campbell, just like ANC has a damn good track team. So, yeah, they're we've baseball. Lost our, and we lost our track coach right after we made them move to the right? CAA. So. I mean, and that, that Campbell baseball team, I, I think it's probably the best in the FCS, to be honest with you. I mean, they, yeah. they took Tennessee, who was the number one overall seed in the tournament, to the brink. Campbell's baseball team is legit, man. They got some ballers out there. Yeah, A&T still growing there. They beat it. They beat UNC last season, but you know they still they still a work in progress. But I like the coach there. So, hey man, we'll I appreciate. See. We'll be competitive in some sports in CAA. We'll see how it goes this season. I'm excited to see but, it. Man. Um, hey, appreciate you, man. Only thing I gotta say, man, Howard should be higher than eight. You got to give them, you got to put some respect on, on, on two and no in the, in the conference, man. You got to I mean, put a little high, bit more respect. The highest they could be is seven. They lost to Alabama State. I could, I could, I could, I'm cool with that. But I know some folks aren't ready to, to, to believe in Howard yet because of, of the history of Howard, right? But, you know, I, I, listen, I, I said they were a dark horse coming into the season. So now I don't look as silly as before, but, you know, now Central Hill homecoming is going to be more interesting this weekend, to say the least. No kidding. They lose if they lose the Howard this Saturday. Oh. I'm, a, I'm praying for Josh. It'd be oh, ugly. Man. Ooh, man, it'd be ugly. I'm driving up there just to talk to him in person about that loss. That that's got to happen. I got. I'm giving him <laughs> hell if Central loses to Howard. <laughs> it, it's going to be disrespectful trash talk if that happens. I'm going to have to give him the hardest time I, can, I possibly can give him. But, hey, man, appreciate you calling in. All right, Mr. Ford called back in, so I'm going to go to him. And then 7166, you're next. But, Mr. Ford, you're live. Yeah, you know I had to respond to the young man. And I, I knew it was say, coming. Yeah, congratulations <laughs> to North Carolina a t winning their homecoming in that game against Campbell. And uh, you say I'm hating on a t No, I'm hating on your president and your – athletic director because I think that they made a move that has reverberated reverberated throughout black college sports and I think it was wrong for them to lead the MEAC when the the biggest problem in the MEAC was that uh, Thomas Mann he's gone and we needed you to be the anchor okay but you hightailed it first you go to the big south and now you go to the you say you're going CA and let me tell you about that blue you just hit it on the head if they go to the playoff, they're going to get beat to death in the first round. If the NCAA have anything to do with it, they're going to send them back out there to North Dakota State. That's where they're going. Okay? So, young man, you are correct. I'm not hating on the school. I'm hating on the president and the athletic director. But I will say this. I am a big fan of Coach uh, Sam Washington. I was a bigger fan of Rod Broadway's and what Rod Broadway brought to that program. But if you go back and – I was at three of them games. Listen, North Carolina a t played Alcorn three times. If you were there, you saw that the, the Alcorn fans outnumbered the a t fans. I don't care if you sold whatever. The Alcorn fans outnumbered you. Okay? So, listen, the, the smart thing would be to match a t against Florida and them in the playoff, but the NCAA ain't going to do that. That's too much like right, because y'all got to understand the NCAA don't do nothing right. So if they did match them up, I would be for that, but that's not going to happen. Like I tell you, 
Don't be surprised with A&T. They fly them out there to North Dakota State for a rematch with the Bison. And that's what North Dakota State is called. Yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that. And there was something else he was saying. Uh, Blue, I'm trying to think. Now, I know he said that I was hating on the team. What was the other thing he said? What was, what was that? You remember um, what he I said? Think he, I think he just said he wanted an apology for thinking Campbell oh, was listen, going to be. Listen, I, I apologize because I didn't think they could play with Campbell. But let me say this to you, Blue. Uh, you would, y'all, you and that last caller was talking about Mentor. Mentor is going up to FBS, but he's going as a defense coordinator. Now, I think he's going to go bigger than Charlotte, okay, because that Charlotte program really is on the ground. I can see him in the Power Five. Mentor knows defensive football. Mentor played under Tom Osborne out at uh, Nebraska. He was under, uh, oh, man, what's that guy's name? He was a defensive ace for the Carolina Panthers. He went to the Green Bay Packers. Blue, you know who I'm talking about. Mentor knows defensive football, but he 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 played on the defensive A's. Remember, remember the guy Carrie Kittles. You remember him? He was from Penn State. No, I I'm trying to rack my brain to think about who you're talking about. Um, I, if you want, Mister Ford, uh, I, my my A and T guy called back in. If if you want me to add him on here, so y'all could talk it yeah, out. Yeah, add him on. Add him right. on. Hi, right, David. You're live with Mister Ford. Look, man, I'm not the one that initially made those comments about you respecting an apology, but we got to stop the madness about what's going on regarding the leadership. Like, right? you got to understand, I understand you don't necessarily agree with the fact that that they made the decision to leave them, but I think there's a, there's a couple of schools within that conference that agree with the, the fact that the leadership has been slacking. Even though we've been, even though the MEAC has been winning, there's a lot of folks that agree with that. that Wait a minute. Is. You're saying the leadership is uh, is slacking in the in the MIAC? Absolutely it is. Wait a minute. I've been saying that 20 years. What are you talking about? But you can tell you that. I've told you, you over and over. You, the main you reason that a t left the uh, MIAC was because they couldn't get Dennis Thomas fired. That's why they left. I know. Man. I've been saying that 20 but years. But that's my point. See, let me tell you. Let me say this to you. See, but you one of them Johnny come lately. Let me tell you something. The I've been school. keeping up with black college sports longer than you've been living. I can tell by the way you're talking. Okay? See, you one of them Johnny come lately. Then you're going to tell me something. Uh, no. Uh-uh. Uh, I've, been te- I've been telling people that Dennis Thomas was, a, uh, was not, a terrible commissioner be, for 20 years. You're not going to be critical on my chancellor. Well, my chances out here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he made a bad decision. decision. Listen, he fell uh, for the Okadoke from Hilton. Okay. Hilton bro. gave him this plan of leaving. Because let me tell you something. I've said it over and over. You're not going to be able to compete in the CAA because you don't have that kind of money. That's why you ain't going to be able to compete. So next year, I'm happy for you what you're doing in the, in the, in the uh, Big South and all of that. Okay. But when you get to the CAA, you don't have that kind of money. You talking about playing Villanova, Villanova spending fifty eight million, you spending sixteen million. You ain't gonna be able to compete in that conference. You can forget it. Well, we'll but see. I, I do mean, apply, I, and you're right, you did you right. I, I would like to say I congratulations on you winning G Ho, because I did not think you would beat Campbell and it was a great job. It was and I, I do give you that. I, I do. Mr. Ford, I, 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 I wasn't I wasn't the same I, I'm not the same guy from earlier that was asking about all your problems. But I think the reason why I'm down here is because you guys are making, you were making it more focused on the athletic side of the set versus everything else. Like, our chancellor grew the university to be the largest university, the largest university in the nation. So, like, there's, there's more to it than just athletics. I know a lot of folks don't agree with the, with the moves that were made, and, but they're going to be fine. They're going to be okay. They have a plan. We're going to see if the money comes with this plan. But they do have a plan. You were hallucinating. You, listen, let me tell you something. What you should do is go back and study Tennessee State. Listen, Hampton ain't doing nothing in that CAA. I mean, they, they might win a few there. games, they but they'll never there. be a threat for the championship. You, and what you're saying that the money you coming, you hallucinating. You are. You're hallucinating. That's not going to happen. But listen, like I said, time will tell. Time I, will tell. My opinion, my opinion about it is this, man. Like, I think that we have – we have alumni that's willing to give as a whole to like general and academics. We just got to start pushing to make sure they start giving to athletics as well. 
I mean, we got one of the largest endowments in HBCUs. We're, we're talking about a brick towards And that's where you belong. You just hit it. You said HBCU. You belong in the MEAC. Or not the MEAC. You belong in the SWEP. You can't compete in the CAA. You don't belong we're, in that. We're, you don't belong in the CAA. Then you're not going to be successful in the CAA. You're not going to be successful. You can forget it. We'll see. You're right. Time will tell. We're going to see. Hey, How long I, are you going to give us before you're going to eat the photo? Hey, I know I'm pretty sure. I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, no, I almost have it. How much time do we need? What do you expect us, when do you expect us to win the titles in the CAA? And I'm not just talking football, because I think we're going to sports, too. So, listen, I'm, I'm, you, I'm, listen, listen, you're not going to be able to compete in football. You're not going to be able to compete in girls' basketball. You're not going to be able to compete in men's basketball. You definitely ain't going to be able to compete in baseball. And you, you just said it yourself. You lost your track and field coach to Tennessee. We got a new one though. We'll see. We'll see what he got. We'll see what he got. We'll see. I I think Mr. Johnson gonna be fine. Hey, I appreciate most. And we got a pretty damn good (laughs) track team, both for the women's and the men's. Hey, I appreciate this year. I appreciate both y'all. Good conversation, Mr. Ford. You have a good one, boss. Hey, yeah, y'all both have a good one. one. Thank y'all for calling back in. I love it. Hey, they both stuck to their points. I'm good for it. 7166. I appreciate you hanging on, man. I don't know how you're following that up, but you're live. <laughs> hey, look, man, I ain't even going to try to compete with Mr. Ford and old boy, man. I mean, it's all crazy. Hey, look, though, I do want to go off, though, man. I, I got to let some things off my chest. So, first of all, hey, look, let me ask you a question, Blue. Have you ever been over somebody's house and seen a baby with a saggy diaper? <laughs> Oh man, yes. Uh, I'll go with yes. That 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 that's that that's Bashaw McCray. Straight baby poop. You know what I mean? Like, dude, listen, dude is not a quarterback. I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I, I could go on and on, but that's just my assessment like of the whole game. That'll tell you everything you need to know about that game. All right, moving on. I had called you earlier in the, the year when the first season first started when, you know, Mana made that comment, you know what I mean, he only paid to win swag games, whatever. And I, I didn't think I was going to get more matter of, at a coach. But did you hear um, the press conference with um, McKinney, McKinley at, um, Tech, from Texas Southern? Yeah, I did. This dude said, you know what I mean, win or lose, you know what I mean, our program is going – Going in the right direction. What do you mean, win or lose? Like, I, I mean, what? How are you already thinking about losing before you even lace them up? Dog, like, man, listen, man, I don't know what's up with these coaches, dog. Like, and for one, he in every press conference, he always looks so, you know, what I mean, timid and nervous. Like, you know, what I mean, like, I can't even see how he rouses his team up. For one, then you won't go in the press conference and say win or lose. What do you mean, like? If my coach that sees me every day in practice, damn, don't believe I got a shot to win, how the fuck I'm going to go out there and damn play? I mean, come on, man. Like, that is straight trash, man. Trash. Like, if I'm going to play, if that's if my boy goes to the TSU, you know what I mean, we go. We got to go. Ain't no way. I, listen, man, I stay in Houston, man. Look, I think the greatest city in the world. But ain't no way I'm gone. That that is trash. But let me get what's your take on that, Blue? Do, do, am I? You think I'm kind of tripping, or do you understand where I'm coming from? No, I I feel you. Because even if you, you know how it is. Even if you don't believe it, you got to tell your team that we're gonna go in there and we're gonna drag them, whoever we play, regardless if it's a money game, conference game, it doesn't matter. I I want my coach to be confident that's why i don't care like i don't care about people talking trash like all the people who get upset about you know people talking trash in press conferences and everything it's just like man that's just football like i want you to talk trash i want you not to like me going into going into this game and i agree he should have just said you know regardless i I don't know how he should have worded it but you can't be like win or win or lose it's like no man when we go in there and we do what we do that's it. And leave it at yeah. that. Even even if Texas Texas Southern is going to be what 
a 20, 25 point underdog at home to Jackson State, you got to go yeah, in there and say, I listen, probably, yeah. I mean, you got to tell your team when Jackson comes in here, we're going to do what we do and we're going to be, we're going to beat the shit out of them. That's what you tell your team. That's the presence you hey. should you should go with, regardless if you know or not that that's not going to happen. Like that, that's what you should do. That's that's what you got to be preaching to your team behind the scenes. Yeah, man, I, I just don't understand it, man. Like you know, I be I be watching those press conferences. I've been seeing them for a while, but you know, like I mean, you know, like I didn't really spend much text other, so like I never really thought nothing. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, what I mean, he was probably gonna get let go in the season because they're going to perform anyway. But I mean, dude, just scream somebody that's just like you know. Hey, I'm just here so I don't get fined. You know what I mean? But um, last thing I, I want to say, um, you know, with uh, South Carolina State, um, I don't know if you saw, but when they had beat Central, the I think it was the punter or the kicker, you know what I mean, they called out, you know, Jack State was like, hey, Jack State, you know what I mean, we coming for you, we want you or whatever. Do you think that possibly it was – they kind of like treated Central as like, oh, once we beat them, we got it on the bag, and they kind of took everything else for granted going into the Morgan State game. Because I don't understand. Like, listen, I mean, Morgan State, I respect the coach, but there's no way they're 31 or have many points they beat them by points better than South Carolina State. I mean, like, that's just such a letdown. So do you think, like, they kind of – you know what I mean? Was looking too far ahead and got smacked for it, or what's your take on that? A little bit of both. I do think they were overlooking Morgan State, but also at the same time, listen, even though they beat Central, they still had issues that they were able to overcome. We talked about the issues when they lost to AT. We talked about the issues throughout all season, even while they were winning, I was like, man, look at the rushing game. Look at the offensive line inconsistency. Their quarterbacks, terrible. And they were able to overcome that and squeak by Central, who had a chance to win late and due to a bad play call and a bad decision, lost that opportunity. And they lost the game. It is what it is. I just don't think South Carolina State, they're all those issues that plagued them all year long, bit, bit them this weekend. And it took a good defensive mind from Morgan State and Damon Wilson and Anton Sewell took advantage of a bad quarterback, forced a bunch of turnovers, and they were able to turn those turnovers into points. And you know, any given Saturday, if Shador goes out this weekend against Texas Southern, throws three interceptions, and Texas Southern is able to turn all three interceptions into seven points, they got a chance to lose, even though they're the better team. Right. It's just yeah, South Carolina right. State, yeah, they got caught overlooking. And they played one of their worst games of the season. That combination of things in football always leads to L's, even if you have the more talented team on paper. Yeah, man, so I completely agree. It's a, I mean, yeah, I don't know what to make of the me, man. But you know, I ain't gonna hold your call line up. You know, what I mean, y'all already done had enough heat for the day. But Blue, good show as always. You know, appreciate you taking the call. Hey, appreciate you, man. I. Three three zero seven, you're live. Hey Blue, what's good, man? Look, I got a parlay. I want you to help me out with Georgia giving Tennessee eight and a half. Who you like? Oh man, you missed that line. I know you're gonna hate to hear this. I looked. I looked at the Tennessee Georgia line on Saturday morning. You could have got Tennessee at plus fourteen and a half last week. Yeah, I know it. I know it. I know Sick. it went down. I what I like Tennessee plus eight. If you're giving me plus eight, uh, give me Tennessee in that one. So you like Tennessee plus eight or plus fourteen? Yeah, for sure. I think if Georgia, I think whoever wins is going to be close. But I don't. I, I, it's still going to be tough to go into Athens and win that game. I'm just going to be honest with you. But Tennessee has that 2010 Auburn, 2019 LSU vibe to them, where they just look like the the chosen team almost. Right. Well, let me ask you this. I know it's the FCS show, but um, what's the test you think the SEC get three teams in this year? Zero. They're not going to let a conference get three teams because you also got to look at the, the the playoff bubble at the FBS. You know, the bubble's a lot smaller. You're going to have the Big Ten champ. 
either Ohio State or Michigan probably, probably undefeated, whoever wins that game. You're going to have Clemson. They're not losing a game in the ACC. And then you're still probably going to have – TCU has a really good chance of going undefeated and winning. So you have an undefeated Big 12, Big 12 champ in TCU. You'll still have a one-loss Pac-12 champ, whether it's USC or Oregon potentially. And then you're still going to have the SEC champ. I don't, I don't think there's any chance any conference gets three teams in a four-team playoff. There's just too many options. Yeah, I agree. All right, on the, uh, on the HBCU, right? So, Jackson State, you know, they've been doing what they do. Let me ask you this. Right now, keeping in mind, Prairie View probably has the easiest schedule in the West. Southern, I feel like Southern still is the best team in the West. Who do you think right now is the – because I'm trying to make plans. I'm a Jackson State fan. I want to make plans. I want to go ahead and, and get my championship game. Who who you think is the likely contender in the West to play Jackson State in the championship? It's going to be PV. Um, you think so? Yeah, because Texas Southern, uh, let's just say, let's just see, let's say everybody, all the games now on go as scratch. Like there's no big upset. Texas Southern's going to pick up another swack loss this weekend against Jackson State. Southern, in my opinion, is going to lose to FAMU this weekend. Alcorn still has to play Jackson State, and they're on like a, what, three-game losing streak in conference? Yeah, Alcorn did to me. Yeah, PV, in my opinion, uh, is walking to the SWAC championship. I think PV is going to, it, by this week, by this time next week, I think PV is going to have it locked up. So I'm assuming you think they're going to beat Alcorn this week. Man, I can't pick. I can't pick all corn. I mean, with how bad they've looked, you get beat thirty-five to six by Grambling, and then you get a short week traveling to PV on the road. I just then that's that's a tough situation for anybody. Okay, all right. That was up, Blue. I appreciate it, man. Hey, appreciate you. Right. Yeah, if PV wins this weekend, it's a wrap. Uh, and. Also, on top of that, I got that combined with PV probably winning on Friday, and I and I like FAMU. Um, I like FAMU beating Southern this weekend too, and that, that's going to wrap it up completely because Alcorn would have four SWAC losses now because you would have losses to Southern, Texas Southern, Grambling, and Prairie View. Then Southern would have SWAC losses to Texas Southern, Jackson State, and FAM, which would be three losses, and then Texas Southern would have what three SWAC losses, Alabama state PV and Jackson state. So I, I just, I don't see how PV doesn't wrap up the wrap up the East this weekend, unless they get upset by all corn um, at home this weekend, which would be a horrible, a horrible loss for PV to be honest with you. And, and Bubba McDowell, I, I know, I know there's a lot of people who quest. Yeah. I would say question the higher, but you got to give him a lot of credit. Bubba McDowell gets a lot of credit for what he's done because everyone, because all the quote unquote star players, Jawan Pass graduated. They lost, I believe, their best wide receiver graduated. Jason Dumas transfers. Uh, Drake Cheatham transfers, and they still find a way to get to the SWAC championship. Man, you got to give, and you got to give them, you got to give him a lot of credit in his staff too because he, he was a late hire, and. I, I I'm just I'm really impressed with Bubba McDowell and in, in the press conferences, man, he gets he's getting more and more and more confident as you go along. But man, let's quickly hit this top 25, man. And I'm gonna get out of here. I got a show for Auburn Live coming up due to the coaching change. Man, no changes in my top nine. I think my top nine pretty much all pretty much stay the same outside of Chattanooga dropping. Uh, Sanford drops, it jumps into the top 10, man. Sanford, Furman, Chattanooga, Mercer are ordered how they are. Sanford has a win over Furman. Furman beat Chattanooga and Chattanooga beat Mercer. So that's why those teams are ordered in that, it, it just in that way. Idaho at 14, they lose a three point game to the number three team in the country. Number two team. If you use the composite poll, I don't, I only dropped them two or three spots due to that loss. New Hampshire jumps up to 15, New Hampshire has been rolling outside of that central loss that they've had. They're undefeated in CAA play, so they they deserve a top 15 spot. Elon wins over Richmond and Delaware. That's why I have Elon ranked above both of them. The Grizz stay at 19. They've had a brutal schedule, but they're going to have to win these next three games to probably make a playoff run. Then the back end, I kept Fordham at 25 because I thought 
Now, I thought they played well against Holy Cross. I don't think they should have dropped out because of that. SEMO experienced a big drop after their loss to Eastern Kentucky this weekend. But with their win over Southern Illinois, I still kept, I still thought they had enough to hang on to the top 25. Princeton undefeated, man. Princeton is rolling right now. Islova, a wide receiver, has been has 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 been extremely impressive probably ivy league offensive player of the year up to this point ut martin hanging on rhode island sitting there at 20 not many big changes man outside of Furman jumping up and and chattanooga dropping all the way to 12 everyone else kind of went scratch elon jumps to 16 from unranked and and that's where i got it sitting right now man i think the top five teams are pretty locked i think six through ten really six through like 13 are pretty close and then the back end the back end of the bracket is um it, it, I would say is, is is also fairly competitive, especially um, moving move, uh, moving down the stretch. We're, we're going to have a lot of games. So just to kind of preview ahead for you guys, Sanford plays Chattanooga next week. Furman plays Mercer. That's going to really work itself out. Sac State, Weber State plays this weekend. That's a top five matchup, and I'm extremely extremely excited to see um to to, to, to see what happens and. Listen, man, I've already told you how I feel about the coaches poll, and there's a lot of uh, – listen, yeah, uh, here's what I say. Fans whose team is ranked really highly in the coaches poll love it. But I just want you to do this, Brian. Go check the coaches poll and tell me if you're happy with the overall makeup of the poll. What the coaches poll does, the, SI, the SIDs are some assistant. The coach tells them to go vote on it because I've asked coaches. There's very few coaches that actually vote on the coaches poll. They give it to an assistant just to kind of fill in. And what they do is spot voting, where if a team was six the week before and two teams lose in front of them, regardless of how that team looked, they just move them up. They don't do any critical like analysis of, of, of what happened. For me, listen, you want Jack State to be at five? Break, break down while uh, – call in. Call the number down below, 701-779-9585. Give me the argument based on resume alone. I don't I don't need any emotional arguments about, well, I just think my team's better. Give me the resume breakdown of why you think they should be fifth right now. Why should they be over Weber? Why should they be over Holy Cross and William & Mary? I, I just need the full breakdown because when you really look at it, William & Mary, an FBS win on the resume. They got two ranked victories on, on their resume as well, plus a win over Campbell, which they won by more points than Jackson State did. Pretty clear who has the better resume up to this point. Holy Cross just has a top 25 win on their resume as well. And it, for right now, man, I think Holy Cross and Jackson are in the same spot. The deciding factor is Holy Cross has an FBS win and a ranked win on their resume. Weber State, top five victory on their resume? As of right now, plus a 30 point win over an FBS school. Man, I I I think I think it's pretty clear who's got the better resume. Like that, that's that's the thing is you've got to look at resumes. I can't just say, oh man, well, and this team, this team might look good if, if that team ever played. You got to eventually start basing resumes. And when and the only reason that UIW is not higher than they are is because UIW has a D2 win. And I I penalized NCCU for it, and I've penalized other teams. I I think UIW having Faulkner in like week nine was, um, was was I know it had to happen because the WAC and South Southland debacle, but I did have to penalize them a little bit for that um, moving forward. But I, I do think UIW could be a little bit higher. That that's an argument that you could make, but I had to keep um, a little bit fair on that. And the reason that Weber isn't at been the top five victories have been just impressive. So. Um, Let's see. Is zero reasons why uh, JSU over Weber State? I test trust your instinct. I mean, I mean, I, I just I, I want to ask Kevin uh, how much we how much Weber State film have you watched? They're pretty they're pretty good, and their one and their one loss was due to the long snapper. See these critiques of AAT are hilarious. I'm gonna just enjoy five and three specialness we build in. It's possible Furman and North Carolina T can meet in the first round. I, I think so. So V, the only reason that I had so my bat so when I put my bracketology together, um when, when you put the bracketology together, you try to make it where 
there's as many 400 miles or less matchups. But like I was just talking on the on one of the last callers, there's so many teams in the North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, Tennessee, that East Tennessee region that there's a lot of teams that you can match up with each other, V. But the all the SoCon teams have to have to miss each other. So you, so Mercer, Chattanooga, Furman, and um. I'm uh, like Sanford all can't play each other because they all play each other during the regular season. Then all the those Southern CAA teams all can't play each other. The, the Richmonds and and et cetera can't play each other. So that's why that's why the matchups are kind of how they were. But you can probably move some around just because there's so many matchups that can be under that 400 mile mark that you never know what the committee is actually going to do. The goal with the bracketology is just to predict who's going to be in. You never know who necessarily will be paired, especially when there's two teams within 400 miles of each other or like three or four teams in that range. You never know who the committee is going to lean to matching the, those teams up with. So it's definitely possible for Furman and A&T to play in that first round, which would be a hell of a matchup too, especially with that run game for both teams. I would love it. Uh, you have a point, but the Campbell score was deceiving. You only play the teams in front of you. I agree. I mean, you can only play the teams in front of you, but at the end of the day, I mean, they both played the same team. And, and I, I think, I think they, if so, let's just say Brian uh, Campbell doesn't score that last minute touchdown. What William and Mary still would have won. Um, Still, still would have won by 16. I think Jackson would have been 15 at that point. The The resumes are similar, but when you have an FBS win and you have multiple ranked wins on your resume, it's hard to rank a team that doesn't have any ranked wins above them on the schedule, especially when there's a common opponent as well. So th that's, that's what you're running into. Like, And I, that would be a hell of a game to watch, too, between William & Mary and Jackson State. But it, it would be very very tough to say that right now jack state has a better resume but i'm gonna take this last caller man we're gonna end the show four eight nine seven you're live hey blue how you doing man what's good bro man i've been sitting here i'm the one who uh basically just laughing at these critiques in the chat of a and t like now we we got to coordinate the students being there all game. Like, just relax and breathe, y'all. Um, my, my question, Blue, was just been on my mind all weekend. And I'm just trying to figure out, like, how we can get – and I've been talking it up in the chat. Like, if teams are putting checks in envelopes to kind of get a – to say, okay, here's I want to host the FCS home playoff game. I'm just trying to figure out, like, it would seem like there should be a pathway where when you look at the number of quality HBCUs that are not in the MEAC or SWAC, and there's no way to ever have that same season competition on the field unless you put a second bowl out there that essentially creates, I hate to call it a plus one, but you basically say between the schools that are in the CAA or the Big South, the OVC, whoever's the best team there gets to play in that large and put that game in either Houston, New Orleans, Mobile, Birmingham, some warm climate. I, I just don't understand, like, why – I looked at the brackets for SPS. What's the problem here? Like, that game's going to make money. Fan bases want to see it. A rising tide lifts all boats. So, like, why, why, doesn't, why can't that happen? So, it's the NCAA for the most part. So, the SWAC and MEAC got a waiver from the NCAA to be FCS teams that play in a bowl game. Because if you – let's break down what FBS and FCS actually means. FCS is the football championship subdivision. FBS no, is I the – I got that. Yeah. So the NCAA doesn't want FCS to have a lot of bowl games that compete with the FBS bowl games. That's really what it comes down to. And I need to get Dr. Cavill back on here to really break down all the behind-the-scenes politics. But that's what it really comes down to is that – the FCS, they want them to stick with their championship playoff model and everything, and they want the bowl game thing to be an FBS thing. Like, the instant of late literally had to give the SWAC and MEAC a waiver to have their bowl game. And so it's really going to come down to whether these other conferences and schools want to go through the process of 
applying for a waiver, trying to find sponsors, trying to find locations and everything like that. It's just it, at the end of the day, the Swack and Miak made, like Ed said in the chat, a business decision. And when you look at the FCS, and this is the sad truth of it, is it's a niche, it's, it's, a, it's a niche market where it's not going to, you're never, regardless of who it is at the FCS level, you're never going to have a school that draws in the amount of people of Ohio State or Alabama. Oh, yeah, or, not, not trying to, Blue, but yeah. here's my question, man. It's like, there's too many, I, I'm listening to your bracketology, and I get it. It all makes sense. But to me, I, I guess when I'm looking at the overall bracket, like, so we can't expand the bracket. I, I just that's why I'm not understanding is why can't we add I just there's too many good teams that are gonna be sitting at home on the couch and I'm just trying to figure out how do, how does that happen? Like FAMU is a worse team than they were last year. But two losses is two losses if they run the table. They're sitting at home. Right? And you can just go down the list and I'm thinking, you can make money here, add one more damn game. And in my mind, you can you can solve a couple issues. You can expand the FCS playoff bracket. Okay, don't call them bowl games. I don't, you know. No, I I'm with you. See, I, I want to see the scenario play out. I'm 100 percent with you. Ask anyone who's been on this channel since I started it four years ago, and then I kind of shifted to FCS. But I've been so vocal. I still think the FCS should have bowl games, and for me, I. I'm in the minority here. I'll just say this. I'm of the mindset that you should shrink the playoffs, have a 16, 12 team playoff, and then have the 13 through 30 or whoever, you know, you want to put include have that many bowl games for that many teams. Because with that super bracket with 24 teams, it's, it's a lot harder to, to me, I'm sorry. I no hate to anyone in these leagues. The Pioneer League doesn't need a team to go in the playoffs. They are going to get drug every year. You're a non-scholarship league. You're not competing with anybody. That, it, that's just the that's the truth of it. I, I'm I'm sorry, but you're 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 taking that bit away from a team in the at large section that probably earned it. So, like, let's say Furman gets left out. Are you telling me that the Pioneer League champion has earned it more than a Furman? And then you're going to have a two two or three lost Furman, two lost FAMU. You're going to have a Montana team who probably played a top two strength of schedule sitting at home. I agree. I think there should be bowl games, and I, I, I'm with you. The problem is the NCAA does not care about the FCS, and if it's not FBS and it's not making them billions of dollars, they really don't care. And it's the sad truth hey, of it, man. And it's frustrating. Can I ask you? Can I ask you one more question about the uh, colonial? Yeah. Like I'm just now, get, I'm just now getting comfortable with the conference. I've been in my feelings about the Aggies leaving the MEAC, but you know, I'm I'm supporting the program. <laughs> so we're going into the colonial. That con. So how's this going to play? That conference. What is it like? Fifty schools in the conference. I mean, I mean, where where are they going with this? It's a lot of schools in that conference, and it feels like they're not done. Am I am I right about that? I mean, yeah. What? I talked to some people this weekend at Elon, who you know it was the Elon Delaware game. A lot of CAA people there. Their goal is to add as many people into the conference, even if they hit twenty, it's fine because what they're afraid of is Delaware, Villanova, some of these top teams. They're going to get an FBS opportunity sooner rather than later later so they'd rather have 20 teams in a conference for a year or two and just it'd be out you know outrageous but if they lose six teams then they're then they're sitting at 14 oh. then they're sitting at 12 if they lose eight they're they're really preparing themselves for like a quote unquote doomsday scenario where that they know Delaware's looking they know Villanova's looking they know some of these top programs are going to be snatched and I think the James Madison move really put the office on high alert and now they're just trying to prepare for the next wave of realignment that might affect the CAA. Okay. All right. Hey, that's, that's my question. I'm going to do some more bracketology homework this week before I come at you with anything else. Thanks a lot, Blue. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, man. Yep. Uh, 
I'm going to get to these last three callers, uh, 3363, 4148, and 5518. Those are going to be the last three callers, man. I got to shut it shut it down because I got to be out of here by 830. 3363, you're live. Three three six three, you're live. Hey Blue, how you doing, sir? What's good, man? Nothing much, man. Just enjoying the show so far. I forgot that you were live tonight, so so forgive me for kind of catching the tail end of some of this stuff. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the playoff conversation and chatter that we're having right now. Um, I've seen the uh, brackets, and um, and I will say that some of the teams are surprising uh, so far, but. Uh, I guess the question I have for you overall is, is in the last caller, I kind of hit on something about teams staying at home. Um, and then, of course, the conversation there about JSU ranking, stuff like that. How much of this is, and I've heard you and Oscar have talked about this several times as well. When do you think that MIAC and SWAG conferences are going to take playing other FCS teams much more seriously? than just who we usually play outside the conference. I mean, not like you see in the chat right now, a lot of a lot of fans just think it's got to be profitable. So I don't think you're going to see them venture out and play a lot of big sky and VFC teams. But what I'm hoping is because there's a history of playing SOCON, especially MEAC. MEAC's played a lot of SOCON teams. Yes. The, the, I'm hoping we see more SWAC and MEAC teams reschedule some of the top SOCON, Southland, OVC. Um, I don't know if the ASUN is going to exist much longer after like next year, but uh, let's just focus on the SOCON and the Southland. I, you can't tell me that the interest, um, the interest isn't there in terms of Incarnate Word versus Jackson State this year. I'm sorry, you can't you can't convince me that that wouldn't be a highly attended and highly sought after game, and then. FAMU Mercer, FAMU, um, who, who do you want to throw in the, the, the um, SOCON at them? Uh, Chattanooga? I, I think that those games. Yeah, Chattanooga, doable, yeah. But, Chattanooga would be a good one. Or, yeah, yeah, Mercer, Chattanooga, yeah. Um, Sanford, possibly, right? Because I saw one break, like, uh, like a, a one potential break, like FAMU playing Sanford in the first round of the playoffs. Like, I'm not sure if that, if that would be feasible or not. It, it could. It would work um, logistically. Like, it's, I think it's under the amount of a requirement. Like I had, um, if family was in my bracket, I'd probably have them go into Mercer to be honest. Right. I'm going to post this to you also. Um, um, I know you got some calls on the phone. Um, I did see that the SWAC has three Southland wins this year. How big uh, of a deal do you think that is when it comes to actually getting a reputation, the conference serve like ranking in the FCS? I mean, that's, I mean, they're, they're all big out of conference wins. Like, um, you know, I I know no one had it just happened to be that no one had incarnate word. I guess that's what people are looking at. But I mean, the SWAC has done, if I'm not mistaken, I got to go recalculate. I'm pretty sure the SWAC has a winning out of conference record this year. I, the MEAC does. Oh, so, yes. But this, I, I'm pretty sure the SWAC is above 500. And so I, I'm I'm happy, man. I'm good with it. I Everyone who the only game I'm trying to think. There was one game that disappointed me because I thought the team should have won, but I'm I'm blanking right now. But Grambling was it Alcorn beaten, over SFA? Was it Alcorn yes, SFA Alcorn was Stephen one? F. Austin should have that, that that should have been an Alcorn State win, but Jackson beat Campbell. A uh, Grambling beat Northwestern State. Uh, PV I, is, they competed with Incarnate Word for the first half, and they went out and beat Lamar convincingly. Now Lamar's you know is what it is, and then also Jackson beat Tennessee State. I mean, they're going out there and winning these games, so you got to give them credit. Now, the fam use and Southerns, I need more from you. You, there's no excuse for you to be playing D two teams outside of FCS schools. But everyone else, man, went out there and won the games that they were supposed to. And a lot of the losses came from the lower tier teams. You look at the um, valleys and, and and teams like that, where I don't, I didn't expect them to compete with Austin P. I mean, to be honest with you, right. Okay. That's all I got, Blue. Keep up the good work, man. Hey, appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Let's see. It's not working. 
We got four one four eight. You're live. Four one four eight. You're live. All right, we're moving on here. And I'm going to address this comment before I get out of here. So this last caller, uh, 5518, you're live. DJ, what's going on, Blue? What's good, man? Oh, everything good. Hey, man, I was just um, looking at how we're going to the celebration ball. I'm hoping they got still got North Carolina Central and South Carolina State. If it goes like playing, I'm hoping that South Carolina State make it because I want to see them G at J them uh, Jackson State again. But at least let it be North Carolina Central. Um, I just think that'll be a um, good game. I don't think Howard flow. Um, I agree with the other caller when he was talking about Alabama State. Let me tell you something. If I'm a recruit and I got a little cousin, and I told him I went to the Jackson State game and I went to the Alabama State game. Alabama State might have the best facilities. And if they could put something together, uh, and I definitely, their defense is stout because they, they was giving Jackson State everything. And I'm, I'm agree with the caller. If they had any type of offensive plan with their facilities, with their school, they can make a big difference. They can really challenge JSU. If I'm a recruit and I'm looking at both of those schools and I went to both of those schools looking at both of them, Alabama State, heads up, heads down. I don't know what's going on in Jackson, but I like Alabama State. And uh, my last thing, man, is I see all this money being made at these SEC schools, the ACC schools. Tell me, Blue, you say you play ball. If you were, if you were a third string at Auburn, would you rather be at Jackson State or Alabama State starting, or would you rather be on the bench playing with Auburn? Appreciate you, man. Hey, appreciate the call. Um, All right. So I'm going to shut down the call lines real quick. Okay, so I'm going to take Auburn out of it. I was raised an Auburn fan. Like, that was my dream to play for Auburn. So, listen, I, I might be cool with chilling on the bench, but let's just take Auburn out of it. Let's say I don't have an, um, let's just say I don't have an offer uh, from, you know, whoever I wanted to go to. Like, hell yeah, I'd rather go play. That's just me. But not everyone's built like not 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 built like me. But like no one, not everyone has that mindset. They'd rather sit on the bench for three years and get that opportunity because they know if you get that one year, look at what happened. The first round pick this past year, he sat on the bench. He got one year to go and 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 ball out. He balled out and was the first overall pick. That's what they're betting on, man. So um, personally, I would rather go start somewhere for three four years regardless of where that is, but that's not how everyone thinks, especially in the age of NIL. Now that's, that's the other thing, but Roby, man, listen, I, I love you. <laughs> Big supporter of the channel. I know, but man, let, let's, let's look at the ho holistic view of this. And, and this is what I tell people head to head wins. Aren't everything because if you, if you say head to head wins are all that matters, that means Morgan state needs to be ranked ahead of South Carolina state. That means South Carolina State would therefore have to be ranked above NC Central. And so are you saying that more and then Morgan State lost to Central? So how do you rank that? Like head-to-head -head wins can't be all you base it on. You can't just say this team beat this team, so therefore they got to be ranked better. If their resume doesn't look better in the grand scheme of things, so that team didn't continue to play well after they beat that team, then then, then ultimately it, it, it doesn't matter in terms of the rankings. Like you can't just say, "Oh, head to head is all that matters," and everything that happens weeks after that game is um, like irrelevant. Like let's let's just let's just look at these two teams' schedule. So yes, NCCU beat New Hampshire, great, uh, big win. They're six and two, but let's, let's they got two wins over uh, one a D two program and then one a NAIA program of Virginia Lynchburg. They got a thirty point loss to Campbell. And then just lost to South Carolina State on the road, who just got drugged by 30 by Morgan State. Now, on the flip side, New Hampshire, they're only two losses. Yeah, they got two losses. One was to an FBS school, 
and Western Michigan. And they lost to North Carolina Central in week three. They also have a ranked win over Elon, who just dominated Delaware this past weekend. And they still got two ranked matchups on their resume. Plus, they beat an undefeated Dartmouth team on the road just a week ago. The, the resume for New Hampshire is much stronger than Central right now. And if Central wouldn't have lost to Campbell in South Carolina State, then hell yeah, they probably would be ranked ahead of them. But two, two sub-FCS wins, a 30-point loss to Campbell, and a loss to South Carolina State, who just got drugged by 30 by Morgan State, is not a bez- better resume than, than New Hampshire with one of their losses being to an FBS school plus ranked wins on the resume. Uh, so you can say whatever you want, but it's not the FCS. The FCS committee doesn't even make a poll. So that's not that's not the committee trying to like hide central. That's just the fact that they got two bad wins over over a D2 and an NAIA school and two really bad losses right now. That's just is what it is. And I understand that people like to get upset because it's it's, you know, their team and their riding for them, But. Man, as a voter and as an analyst, you got to look at it without any of the emotion in. The stats don't lie. The resumes don't lie. And it's the fact of the matter is Central does not have a better resume than New Hampshire right now. And it it, it just is what it is, man. And I, I know people don't like to um, – hear that but listen guys appreciate y'all tuning in man over two hours tonight uh we'll be back on sunday night um next week uh this week i'll be up in nashville tennessee state semo still looking forward to going up there man to seeing those two teams man gino has draylon ellis all, all the big players in that game of uh, the week after that um i should be at jackson state uh alabama a and man it's just <laughs> That game doesn't have the appeal anymore, man. It, that, that game's I don't know how great that game's going to be, so I'm still debating on whether I need to travel that weekend. But I should I'll probably be at Jackson State, Alabama a And M. I'll just say I'll just put that as for now, and then um, I'll also be at Alcorn State, Jackson State, the final week of the season. Then um, that, that, that then I'll be making my playoff plans, and of course the Celebration Bowl as well. But man, guys. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Hit the like button on y'all's way out. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. If y'all want some Auburn info on the coaching search, man, you can turn over to Auburn Live. That's where I'm headed right now. But appreciate y'all so much. I'll be back Wednesday with the Week 10 FCS preview. But until then, guys, I'm out. (laughs) 